everyone here again um, and good morning good afternoon and good evening to everyone uh, who has joined us virtually um, it is my distinct pleasure um, that we are joined by the global health network team here today um, and a moment of great pride that our efforts from the last two years are finally bearing fruit um, and we are um, starting with the launch of a capacity building health research network in Pakistan. A few housekeeping rules. Um, I realize everyone is having lunch, uh, but if the crisps can be, you know, maybe uh, shaken a little less, <laughs> that would be very helpful. Uh, Mobile phones, if they can be switched uh, to a silent mode, that would also be very helpful. Um, uh, another thing that a disclaimer is that this meeting is being recorded and this will be uploaded on the Global Health Network website. Um, our media team is also going to be taking few pictures today. So if everyone is not comfortable with their pictures being taken, please do let us know and we can blur out those spaces. Um, lastly, and most importantly, um, during the presentations, we'll not be stopping for questions. Uh, we have a group discussion which is planned um, uh, from 2.30 onwards. So if you have any questions, please note those down. Uh, if you can't stay beyond 2 p.m., we'll be you know, happy to get back to you with answers to those questions, and um, we'll be happy to discuss those during our discussion. So um, we'll be having um, an initial part of the discussion between 1 to 2 p.m., uh, but this meeting is going to go on till 4, 4, 4 30 p.m. today. So uh, those of you who have um, the flexibility of doing so, uh, it would be great if you can stay and join us in this discussion. Um, if not, it's absolutely okay. So, um, so if I can. Okay. So, um, a little background, uh, my favorite slide. Um, uh, for the most vulnerable populations of the world, health research offers a potential for change, which largely goes untapped. So for lower middle income countries, the only way to bring about change in health equity for us is through research. However, we, we lack the many um, elements of health research profile the many elements of health research profile, including health research priorities, resources, uh, a way to produce that knowledge, a way to package that knowledge through networks, and finally, the impact of health research on policy and practice. So, uh, okay, um, and because of this, most low middle income countries suffer from a 1090 gap in research, which is that less than 10% of the world's resources are being used uh, to study the problems of more than 90% of the world's population. And this gap was identified nearly 30 years ago uh, and unfortunately continues to exist for most lower and middle income countries of the world, including Pakistan. Um, all is not gloomy. So for Pakistan, there has been progress. There has been a rise in the number of schools over medical schools over the years with some rise in the budget allocation for research by the Pakistan Medical and Research Council, which is now the Pakistan Health Research Council, and with a consequent increase in the number of publications. Initially, uh, that increase in number of pu publications was largely in non-index journals, but over time, uh, our output in index journals uh, also increased considerably in health research from Pakistan. However, we still struggle with many challenges. We don't have a mechanism to prioritize health research as per our local needs. Often research is dictated by the funding or um, you know, the collaborator's wish uh, or whatever we can do with what we have. Uh, so it's not um, responsive to the local health research, uh, local health needs. Uh, there's patchy infrastructure with some uh, centers of excellence, uh, very few centers of excellence, and often those centers of excellence are not uh, connected with the larger community. Um, there is some funding gap as well. Um, and then, of course, human resource and capacity remains a huge challenge for us. Um, because not only do we not have uh, mechanisms to develop this capacity, we also don't have a framework for that. The governance of research in terms of both its ethics and regulatory governance uh, often struggles with many challenges, including um, the lack of a consistent um, framework, as well as the, the, the patchy implementation of our regulations. Uh, Dr. Farah later today is going to be talking a little bit in that also. Um, 
we have few research networks, but unfortunately, most of these research networks are not robust. Um, and it is this robustness that is not leading to uh, a lot of change, again, which is responsive to local needs. Um, in international uh, research collaborations, uh, we don't have equitable research partnerships. It's often um, left to the whim of an international collaborator uh, and partnerships only result in us providing data and images uh, and not really resulting in uh, change for either research capacity or any change in health research access for us. And finally, and most importantly, um, there is little evidence of the impact of what research we do produce uh, on our health policy and practice. So, um, so how do we improve this? Uh, to improve this, uh, there's a wish list that we have with our partners at the Global Health Network, and they will shortly be introducing themselves, so I will not go into the details of what they do right now. Uh, we, we wish to you know, upskill the workforce uh, in health research through various educational and career development initiatives. We, we wish to also understand the barriers and enablers of strengthening research capacity in Pakistan so that we, we develop a curriculum that is truly responsive to our local needs. Um, and then to increase partnerships between lower and middle income countries as well uh, for health research by connecting excellence, because excellence does exist amongst us also. Um, and so, so this is our wish list. We have several uh, things uh, planned to achieve this wish list. Uh, and we would you know, be beyond delighted if all of you join us in this venture. So our agenda today is going to be introducing to all of you the Global Health Network who have been working with us for last two years um, uh, to reach this day, announcing our commitment to work together formally, uh, launching the Pakistan Center for the Knowledge Hub, uh, which is again a, a space and a community of practice uh, available for health researchers anywhere in the world, uh, sharing some of our previous collaborative work that we have done with the network. Dr. Farah would be sharing her project in that. And finally, and most importantly, we will hold a group discussion to understand what are our core needs uh, to understand um, uh, for health research capacity development in Pakistan. So um, I'll end here. Uh, and I will now invite uh, Dr. Asif Loya, um, our medical director uh, for Shaukat Khanum Cancer Hospital, Lahore. Um, and Professor Trudy, I think, has joined us online. So I'll stop sharing so we can see her um, and I'll let both of them take over um, the next part of this. So Professor Trudy, if you could start. Um, again, um, I would just briefly introduce Professor Trudy Lang is a professor of global health research. She is the director of the Global Health Network at the University of Oxford. Uh, and she's also a phenomenal um, a human being and somebody who's really committed to the cause of uh, capacity building. So Professor Trudy, uh, over to you. Well, thank you for your kind introduction, um, Mariam. But it's uh, we all share the same um, vision, don't we? Of um, as you say, upskilling the workforce, and as, as WHO always put it, is putting research systems into health systems. And um, so we're really, really excited to be with you all this morning. And um, it's great having Mercedes and Frank with you in person. And um, and so sorry, I'm joining you online today, but you're very well represented by. Um, my colleagues who have been um, with you all week. So I think um, Mercedes is sharing some slides for us if you want me to go through um, our brief introduction. Um, so we can just give you a bit of background on what the Global Health Network is and then take you through um, what we're hoping to do with you all um, across, across the country and the region. There we are, perfect. Thanks, Mercedes. So, the, um, the Global Health Network is actually all of us, and I know many of you are familiar with it and use it already, but the, uh, the idea actually began about 12 years ago, um, back, in, um, back in Kenya. Um, we can't quite see your slides yet, Mercedes. I think that's just waiting to come up. But the, um, perfect, thank you. So I was um, working on malaria studies actually, and working out in Africa working with many different groups who were looking to try and um, set up, um, we were working on malaria studies, but other groups were working on HIV, TB malaria, maybe diarrheal disease. And what was really clear is that the, um, the things that made research difficult weren't really varying. 
And we were trying to make that big shift from um, what was often happening in the past was teaching groups to want to run a study where the data went back abroad to international sponsors. And that doesn't leave really lasting research teams able to lead and run their own studies. So, so that's really where it all began. So can, next slide, please, Mercedes. So I was really pleased to see um, Mariam just now point out the 90-10 gap, and it's just too true. And it's, you know, the first studies with these on the 90-10 gap were probably 20 years ago. And it's a bit depressing that we haven't shifted too much because it is still the case that of the studies that are happening in the global south, too many of them are still run um, by researchers elsewhere. And we need to have um, far more real capacity to lead and get funded and become internationally competitive as researchers across the global south. Next slide, please. So I often um, use this slide to talk about um, why this is um, why the approach that we're bringing can work and we can all fix this together. And um, and I use um, here um, the slide on the right with the picture of the virus was around COVID. But I also think, for example, Zika is a really good example because we knew so little. But this is also true for any disease. You know, what I'm talking about now, you could you could swap out Zika, malaria, TB, diarrheal disease, um, anything you like, because the point is that if we're going to tackle any disease, we need a whole ecosystem of health research studies. We need to um, do the surveillance to spot it in the first place and understand the threat. We need to characterize the disease with observational studies. And um, we need to understand the community and what their perceptions are about the disease and what they can do to change maybe transmission or um, risk to themselves or, or behavior changes to, to mitigate the impact of these diseases. Obviously, we need to do clinical trials if we do have interventions to test. Um, this is why Zika is a good example, because there wasn't even any clinical trials in Zika because there was nothing to test. Um, we need to have diagnostics, obviously, and um, maybe we'll get to a vaccine point quite early on. Um, and all this needs to be embedded in a health system so that the findings can be taken up into policy and practice. And so we need all those types of health research. But, you know, if you break those, uh, each any of those down, Every type of health research study needs a good question. It needs to work within that community in the setting where you're doing the study to understand the question in that context and know what can be measured to make sure that you're answering the question in the right context and that you're measuring the right outcome. And then you operate your study to collect the data in a safe, ethical and accurate way, whether it's a surveillance study, a clinical trial or community engagement. You then need to collect your data in a way that's accurate and responsible and ethical. And of course, analyzing it and making sure you get the right answer, making your data available for others to use. Um, but it doesn't necessarily need to move. It's about bringing data science to the regions. And then, of course, making sure that those findings can be of impact to the community that they were destined and developed for. And so this cycle in this health research system is exactly what the Global Health Network is all around trying to provide everybody in any healthcare settings with tools and resources to undertake any type of study and to, to, um, and to use every element of that um, research cycle to make sure they're doing high quality research. Next slide, please, Mercedes. And so what is the Global Health Network? Well, as I say, it began in Africa um, probably 12 years ago now, but it's now grown to be this vast, global, connected community. So the Global Health Network is everybody, it's all of us. It's really an approach and a, and a shared franchise idea. Um, there is a digital platform, um, but I always say that's just the vehicle really. And we've, you know, it's the people like the Gates Foundation are welcome and invested a lot in the digital platform. But actually, it's the research organizations that share their information on the platform. But it's also the hundreds of thousands of frontline healthcare workers, pharmacists, doctors, clinicians, nurses that come every day to find training, but also templates and tools and resources. So there's over 60 different component topic areas on the on the digital platform. And then there's hundreds of thousands of um, maybe SOPs or template protocols or how to do informed consent or how to do community engagement are all there for you to come and find and um, but obviously also hopefully share what you've done as well and so it's this vast community that connects up excellence so you can share between those disease areas and you can learn about those different component areas and um, next slide please so this is the exciting thing we're here to talk about today because um what we're really um 
talking about is setting up uh, the Global Health Network in Pakistan with the hosts um, with you. And this is um, really creating this global south um, connected community where we have the Global Health Network, Africa, Asia and Latin America. And it takes the Global Health Network into your organisations and so you can use it as a facility to connecting up with each other, to working together and for accessing all those resources. And it's a digital hub and that's really important and you can connect and find um, resources and tools and training. But it's also about activities on the ground and things like doing research clubs in hospitals or supported learning or um, data science clinics um, in your healthcare settings and using the systems we've developed to do those. So anyone could run one of those activities and really help um, build up um, the research capacity in any setting. So we've been made a WHO collaborating centre. And that's really exciting because it means that everybody's part of this WHO collaborating center. And the aim of the research and health team at WHO is to have uh, research embedded in every healthcare center. So this is really even taking this um, further forward and putting that whole concept of putting a research um, ecosystem in everywhere where there's healthcare being delivered. And, and hopefully the, the approaches that we've developed over all these years with this concept of the Global Health Network can help everybody um, in, in that goal. Next slide, please. So um, exactly how does this work? Well, this is around um, building research skills, capacity, experience, career opportunities at scale. So there's the, the digital platform um, that you can access for all the resources, but there's also that any group um, can run activities in their hospital, in their clinic, in their laboratory to really share excellence. You know, you have fantastic excellence in your country. Um, it's been amazing getting to know Mariam and the team and just seeing the amazing work um, that the clinical research um, team is, is doing. And I know that's true across the country and the region. And so how can you um, really take the excellence that you have and maybe share it into different disease areas where there is less capacity or different hospitals and settings or laboratories where they're not as experienced as research. So really um, building that um, ability as a country to, to compete internationally, to win grants and to publish papers, to have findings that are taken up into policy and practice. And so that is around um, through this federated partnership, it's about equity and access to training and information and working together in a sort of neutral shared area and have this open um, shared space um, and mechanism to, um, to run these sorts of activities in your healthcare setting or in your laboratory. Next slide, please. So what could we actually do together um, to take this forward? Well, um, there's a whole range of activities that can happen and these work really well. So, you know, many universities have things like um, journal clubs where well, you could switch that and have something called a research club um, and maybe in, in a clinic or a lab or a hospital every month um, or even more often. Um, you can come together and just um, maybe one week talk about um, how to do basic training in health research or focus on particular topics like um, research ethics or community engagement or setting the research question or data science and just by having that discussion that brings people working on different diseases and brings their own local experience to, and it, you know and I said in the first slide if your experience might be running cancer studies but that those experiences are completely translatable to working on infectious disease or um, or perhaps in maternal health care and so just bringing researchers together in an organization is a hugely powerful tool for sharing expertise and working over the stumbling blocks together and um, maybe import, in, improving regulatory or institutional research um, review, um, any one of these areas that you, you can do. And, and because we've been rolling these approaches out across the globe, and um, we've got tools and resources to help that happen um, and can share those so that you can do them. And hopefully the overall impact is lasting capable research teams in your institutions that can apply for grants, can win awards, because you can conduct safe, ethical and accurate research that is internationally competitive and can win grants um, and international rep reputations and ultimately build your careers. Next slide, please. So back to what I was saying at the beginning around this whole um, environment for research that um, tackling any disease requires this whole ecosystem of evidence and then in any one of those types of studies, you can break it down into these um, key areas 
of setting the question, developing a protocol, operating a study, um, looking after the data, getting the answers that you need, and then taking them back to the community. And so really what we're providing is tools and resources for every single one of those steps, and, the, and then the facilities for developing those skills across your teams um, and across and sharing them between disease areas, organizations, and across the regions and giving you access to how others have done it across the global south, but also from particular research organizations like um, the WHO or the Gates Foundation or Welcome or CEPI, the vaccine group, so that you can access those same standards and tools and put them into practice in your, um, in your research. Uh, next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and it would be great to take some questions and have some discussions, but um, I hope what I've conveyed is what we've really learned about how um, the steps and difficulties in undertaking research and being research leaders don't vary, and that we can make huge, huge development strides together, but just by connecting excellence um, in, a, in a region um, between those with um, you know, high volume of experience and um, international reputation and working with groups who have less experience. And that you can use what has been developed with the Global Health Network platform and activities to really um, use those in, in your um, hospitals and laboratories to really make a difference. And so this is where we really hope to take this forward um, today and we'll work together and show that it's not difficult or expensive, but it's just a matter of uh, sharing um, expertise um, within the country, across the region, but also connecting globally. And we hope that will bring equity in where research happens and who benefits, but really enable careers to be built and thriving research teams that can win grants and, and grow your international represent, um, reputation. Thanks very much. That's the last slide for me and really keen to, to hear from you and take questions if we're able to do that. Thanks, Mercedes. That was brilliant with the slides. Thank you, Professor Trudy. This was um, a wonderful summary of what your fantastic network does. Um, uh, we'll take questions in a few minutes. Um, I'll first like to invite Dr. Asif Loya, our medical director. Um, to you know, join us and um, share his thoughts about this work together. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Trudy, for uh, this very nice introduction. Uh, I'm really excited on part of Shavit Khan and uh, Memorial Cross to be joining this uh, uh, global health uh, partnership in health research. Really, uh, very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's part of our mission statement as well, um, as we all know, uh, perhaps. I can convey it for you as well that research is part and parcel of that mission statement. And uh, this is something that we always strive for to uh, build on it and to um, you know, achieve excellence in that. So we're really looking forward to this opportunity and uh, we hope we can um, achieve um, um, huge milestones with this. And um, it'll be a, a great way to uh, enhance the research capacity that we continue to uh, strive and you know, achieve uh, especially the grants that we keep looking for, uh, because they're really um, not that forthcoming, especially the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical grants and uh, the various uh, uh, research trials and the grants related to that are really difficult to come by to this country. So I think this would probably help us hold on that. So looking forward and uh, any questions for uh, Trudy and or the team, um, please uh, go ahead. Anyone? Okay, thank you. So, uh, Mariam, uh, what's uh, the next? Uh... Um, thank you so much, and thank you, Professor Trudy. Um, I think that um, questions and discussion is uh, possibly going to roll further as we move into our discussion section. Um, um, I so next we move on to an introduction of the. Uh, knowledge hubs that Professor Tudi had mentioned. Uh, and one of the knowledge hubs that has been set up uh, is a knowledge hub for research related capacity building for Asia. Uh, and Pakistan is going to be joining that part of the Global Health Network uh, knowledge hubs. Uh, Dr. Selvia Zeshan is going to be introducing that for us. Um, uh, she's an MD, PhD, um, and so with a background in public health and extensive work experience, she is you know, the perfect person for this. Um, and she'll take us through what the Asia Knowledge Hub does. Over to you, Dr. Selvia.
Assalamu alaikum everyone, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mercedes? Okay, sorry. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Salvia Zishan uh, and I am coordinating the Global Health Network's regional efforts in Asia. Thank you for having me here. Uh, today I'm going to give an overview of the Global Health Network Asia uh, ongoing as well as planned activities. Uh, so Trudy mentioned this uh, in her presentation, but uh, I want to highlight that in the efforts to push the agenda of research capacity strengthening in and uh, the shift of leadership to the Global South, the Global Health Network and with support from a renewed grant has established three regional hubs, which are Asia, Africa and Latin America and Caribbean uh, with coordinating centers overseeing activities in these regions. Uh, the overarching aim is to scale the network with partnerships hosted by research organizations. Uh, so this is what the map of our regional leadership currently looks like, and it is only growing. We are working uh, very closely with these countries and institutes of research excellence. Uh, to build research capacity, we really need people in posts in the regions to lead the capacity building activities. So we are expanding our regional team with coordinators in posts who will be supporting and running activities like skills sharing workshops, supported learning sessions, twinning programs, and research clubs. A key regional partner for uh, our regional efforts in Asia is the ICDDRB, which is based in Dhaka. They started with the uh, diarrhea research and developed the widely used ORS, but now expanded to addressing many different public health issues. Uh, for this work, uh, they will also be leveraging their networks and partnerships with local teams and organizations. So when we say we want to be building research capacity, we what we really mean is that we'll be building learning programs developing long lasting networks, uh, supporting career development for researchers, as well as really embed a culture of research in every setting. And how we will go about doing this is through the regional activities, on ground activities like supported learning sessions, twinning programs, research clubs, data science clinics, as well as support for grant management. And we will be leveraging the Global Health Network's Trusted Community of Practice, which is a network of researchers, healthcare workers, and policy makers, as well as the really vast digital platform hosting teaching, training, and career development resources. Also, we'll be building off of the country partner sites, strong teams, networks, and experience in delivering high-quality research. So this is an example of an on-ground um, re uh, research capacity building activity. It's a supporting learning session. Uh, the Global Health Network's online training center houses a series of free, short, and fully online modular e-learning courses. And they have been authored by uh, subject matter experts. They target research skills and uh, even provide uh, certificates of completion. So an example of how a learning session could be conducted uh, is by having a, the group of participants in a, in a suite full of computers, and it doesn't have to be very many, but then they get together, uh, maybe have a, a talk or a seminar given by a subject expert, and then it's followed by the undertaking of the modules on the platform, and the participants can then be given a certificate of completion at the end of it. Um, Another example is a research club, which is a platform to discuss research projects, challenges faced, and opportunities for improvements by the participants, and they can also connect for future work together. It can be as uh, formal or informal as, um, as can be planned. Uh, it could be hosted and held in an educational or clinical setting um, and uh, have interested students, clinicians, or upcoming researchers as participants with uh, the Global Health Network's available resources, uh, skill development and training 
experience, our teams can really support to facilitate research club sessions in your institutes. We also have a toolkit on how to set up a research club, which is a step-by-step -step guide for doing so. And uh, you, can, you can use the toolkit and run your own research club. You can also uh, give us ideas if you have already done so, or if you use the toolkit to, to implement a research club on how we can refine it, uh, add context, a regional context, or even maybe have, have it in a different language. The possibilities are endless. Uh, a twinning scheme, uh, the Global Health Network's twinning and site exchange scheme aims to deliver targeted learning through an active participation and peer mentoring approach. Uh, a less experienced site might be paired with and mentored by a more experienced site. And uh, these pictures are examples uh, from the Africa Alert Group, uh, where there was a twinning between uh, one site and one team visited the other. And also there was a reciprocal visit to offer more technical support. So I want to bring your attention to the Global Health Network's Asia Hub, which is an online platform or uh, a, really a working space for the community of practice to access as well as share their own resources. The resources could be in the form of workshops, toolkits, study pro protocols or documents from the studies that have been conducted. And uh, if, if anybody shares their work, they can be assigned the DOI number so you can get the credit and visibility for your work and you can also share it with others. Uh, these are some of the uh, resources that are specific or specifically relevant for the Global Health Network Asia community. Um, and it can really provide easy access. Uh, there are workshops that were developed by teams in the regions topics that are relevant for or produced by researchers in the Asia region. We also uh, regularly update events that would be useful uh, for participants to know about, say, for example, we, we, had, uh, we had included the Shokat Hanum Cancer Symposium as an event. So could, for increased visibility, we also have some of the resources in the regional languages are only going to add, we're going to be adding more to them. Um, we have a few toolkits, like I mentioned, the setting up of the research club toolkit that all of you can use as well as share. Uh, and like I said, it could be it, it could be developed in a different language as well. Uh, we have and will also be having more of country specific materials on the hub so the users can find their peers working on the same topic or in the same geographic location or facing similar challenges and really finding opportunities for growth and working together. We can also include a dedicated space for resources specific to an institute, say for example, the Shokat Hanum Institute for them to be available specifically for its own team. And uh, this is the Global Health Network, the Global Health Network and the Asia um, URLs. I would encourage everyone to join the network and use the resources that are available, uh, become a part of the existing community, build your own community of shared interests. Um, the email is uh, down below. Please stay connected with us. Let us know what you need, share your work with us, and we can all engage in meaningful discussions to benefit us all as well as the world in general. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Sylvia. This was a wonderful presentation. And thank you also for sharing the various resources that are available uh, for us. Um, at this point, um, I think if, um, Frank, you could also like share uh, some of your perspectives. Because uh, so Dr. Frank Agoro, he leads the, uh, the African Knowledge Hub from the Global Health Network. Uh, so perhaps like in few words, if you could share your experience and how that might have helped research capacity building in Africa. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Shukriya. Um, thank you really for 
all the hospitality and inviting us. And we are very privileged to be amongst you, um, especially for this opportunity. So I'm a special epidemiologist, um, but I, I trained as a medical doctor and then I did clinical trials and then I got into public health and got lost in it until now. But I was once a clinician also sitting like one of you. And uh, um, I'll give you an example of my personal experience. Um, I'm from Tanzania in East Africa, uh, and uh, I work for the Global Health Network, but I relate more to Africa than Europe probably. And um, around 2013, I was a clinical coordinator and we were doing a study on children. And I needed, I needed SOPs, standard operating procedures, to help my staff. I had around 16 to 20 staff. Some of them were clinicians seeing patients, others were data clerks, and others were laboratory technicians. And we had a lot of logistics and drugs and everything to control. But in order to be able to get a team that understand what they're doing, we had to keep doing training. But then, since the clinical trial for fevers in children was very early in Tanzania, I did not have these tools. And I wasn't a super specialized clini uh, cl uh, clinical trialist. And the best thing that happened to me, I had colleagues who were working in another institute in Kenya, Kemri, where Trudy was based. And when we reached out to them, they sent to us the ISOPs. And it is one thing that I kept it to, came to understand that some of those materials that they shared with me were already hosted at the Global Health Network. We were already using the Global Health Network to train for good clinical practice, GCP. I hope a few of you have done GCPs. Who has done GCP, you see? And where did you do it from? The Global Health Network, you see? So I was once just like you, I did GCP from the Global Health Network, but I did not know there were so many other training within it. But what, it, what is it exactly? Because it's a network, it's not, it's, and these materials come from people who are you and me. Why am I saying this? When Trudy started with One Knowledge Hub and added materials, she started contacting other researchers from different groups in Africa to provide materials. And a good number of them also were in Europe because a lot of researchers are based there and they shared their materials. And that's how the network started growing. And now we have hubs in Latin America, Asia, Africa. And in Pakistan, we've been working with Mariam for the past maybe couple of years, two years, but we want it not to be something that we, it's just us. We want all of you to contribute. And why is that important? Knowledge is not fixed. And there is no factory somewhere producing knowledge. Each one of you, every day what you interact, what you do, you can contribute to another person. What you do, I'm sure in your teams, if my computer stops working, who should I contact? You know exactly who to look for. Or if you wanted to know directions of going for, uh, for a nice weekend trip, you definitely know who to look for. So even in research, when you want to know how to, how to take sample, maybe pipetting, or you want to draw blood, there's someone who knows to do that. So instead of that knowledge being with you, if you, you, work, you come to the network and we help you to develop something we call toolkit, and we give it your name because you're the one who made it, we give it a DOI, it's a digital object identifier, and they publish it, then anybody in the world will use your tool. And you can know, we can help you to know, or you can find yourself why in the world it has been used. But then that's not enough. We are not only producing knowledge to put it somewhere so that it stays. No, we want it to bring so that you can train more people. So those are the supported, supported learning sessions which Salvia was communicating. And my most favorite part is data. 
Why is that important? Why is data important? Does anybody know what data is? Do we know? Information. Have you contributed to data today? Yeah, if you're just saying yes, I can tell maybe 50% of you said yes, that's already information that's going to become data. And maybe we can say now, how many people are awake? Only those who said yes. So why is that important? We do this every day. As clinicians, when we meet our patients, we speak to them. We know about their health and unhealth conditions. We put those in paper. Why do we put them on paper? So that they can help us make a diagnosis, so that we can communicate with others. But at the end of the day, it's us trying to help our patients, our populations. So everything we put on chart for the patients doesn't have to end up there. We have to make sure it makes sense. That is called data literacy. It's protected. That's called um, It can be privacy, it can be governance, because then it, can, it has to go back and help the community. It has to be for the good of the community. Not we have to fill files, put them on a shelf somewhere, forget them, they get dust, and then we throw them away. But I, I, one thing that we have noticed for, from the Shaukat Kanam um, Symposium, there's a lot of research people are doing here. So the aim is now to see how we can scale what you're doing, but also train more people to know what research is. So the Global Health Network helps you to do all those. So what we do is work with teams to, um, to, to facilitate or enable knowledge exchange. So th through talking to each other, then we can be able to propagate that further. And that's why we, we are in Pakistan today. And there are groups working in different parts of Asia, as, as my colleague showed. So I want you to connect it to all of them, but not that, not just that. Another example, two months ago, I was in Tanzania and Mariam reached out. There was a, a grant application that needed colleagues from Latin America and Africa. And quickly, Mercedes and I managed to reach out to such colleagues and we put up a proposal. We built a consortium just, I don't know, within two weeks. We had a consortium of cancer researchers in LMIC. So the, despite in our clinics, we are in silos, we are people who, who live in the profession. When we meet here, we call each other, we, we, can, we can call our community a community of practice because we believe in a certain philosophy and we want to propagate knowledge. So we want to grow this community bigger so that we can be able to reach other researchers where they are. That's my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I think this was um, a really engaging summary of uh, your work. Um, so um, I think we'll uh, move to uh, Dr. Farah's talk now. Um, and then um, immediately following that, uh, we'll be beginning our group discussion. So I, I'll invite my friend and my colleague, Dr. Farah Asif, um, who's going to be sharing with us um, a remarkable project that she was able to do right in the dead center of the pandemic, in addition to juggling various other things. Um, it's a very interesting project about the research ethics review framework in Pakistan, uh, from, you know, especially viewed during a public health emergency. Um, and she'll be sharing some details of the output of that project so far and what we wish to do with this further. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. So my name is Farasif, as Mariam has told you about my project. So in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I would be talking about um, um, an initiative that, that is focused on research ethics review framework within Pakistan. So, um, and I, I would like to thank everyone 
who have uh, managed to join us today. So thank you, Asim, for, for the slides. Um, so um, in the last few days, because we had our symposium, uh, you might have gone through, um, you might have heard about some facts about related to Pakistan as well as facts related to uh, research in Pakistan. So I'll try, I do not repeat them in, in, in detail, but we'll just uh, briefly uh, cover some facts about Pakistan as well as health research in Pakistan and research review in Pakistan. That is just to give you a context of, um, of this initiative that we have been doing with the support of the Global Health Network as well as GCPA, GCPA Alliance Europe and a strategic initiative of development of research ethics capacity in developing countries. And uh, Francis P. Crawley has been uh, a project mentor um, in this uh, project. So um, as you all know, and we have covered that already today, that Pakistan is a lower middle income country. Uh, and it is um, doing like under investment in, in research. Uh, because of the economic challenges that it is facing. Uh, Pakistan is, um, the, the health system of Pakistan is quite complex. At times it is referred as mixed healthcare system or at times it is referred as fragmented healthcare system. So the healthcare system uh, is consists of private sector, public sector. Then we have support from our philanthropic donors as well as um, uh, there are alternative uh, med medicinal uh, systems as well. So these all constitute like Pakistan healthcare system. So the strength of uh, public health uh, care system is that, that it has a wonderful reach within the community uh, through its three tiered um, uh, structure. It has our community reach program, which is uh, which comprised of more than 100,000 lady health workers and community healthcare workers. And the important thing about this, this factor is that they do have a big trust and that is very important. One of the challenges that our public healthcare system is um, facing is that uh, because of the underinvestment, it is at times it is not sufficient to meet all the needs as well as it's, uh, it cannot meet all the quality expectation. So then comes the private healthcare sector. Private healthcare sector is covering like for two thirds of our um, healthcare delivery needs. Uh, but the problem with that system is that it, it, it is poorly regulated. This is largely unregulated. So, uh, so that is like um, about the major uh, systems which are providing the healthcare in Pakistan. So um, to, to look at the performance of, of, um, of our healthcare system, it, let's have a look at the key health indicators of Pakistan. So the, the first thing is that it is heartening that over past 25 years, our healthcare indicators, the, these has improved. We have been facing economic challenges. We have been facing geopolitical challenges, but at, at this point in time, this is a huge uh, positive thing that, that our healthcare indicators, these have improved. But the challenge is that we still lag behind if we compare ourselves with our peer lower middle income countries. So that's remain a challenge. So we do uh, face a double burden of diseases. So we, we, uh, we have burden of communicable diseases as well as non-communicable diseases. And Pakistan is prone to disaster as well. And when I'm talking to you, we just have witnessed the worst floods in Pakistan. With, uh, as a result of which one third of Pakistan was like uh, facing floods. Uh, population growth remains a challenge uh, and because of the underinvestment in, in, in health, this is a threat uh, we need to address. And in, in Pakistan, the health access uh, remains a challenge. Equitable health access is a challenge. Um, the healthcare delivery is better in urban, country, uh, in urban areas. However, uh, the healthcare access is patchy when, it, when we are talking about our rural population. And this is worthy to note that most of our population is like rural po population. 
at, at the same time, there are other challenges, uh, which is like geopolitical challenges, and we need to mention them that they, as they play a very important role. So we have seen this uh, slide already, so I would not uh, spend too much time on this. So we have, we have seen that clinical research output, it has increased uh, uh, during the last decade remarkably. And in the year 2018, we uh, witnessed uh, that the research output uh, of Pakistan was highest when it, it was compared with like um, other countries. So this is remarkable. And we have already seen uh, that at times the impact or the quality of the research output that we are producing, that is at times uh, questioned because it remains variable. And uh, there is evidence uh, that says uh, that the, the, the research output that we are producing, it is not being used for uh, policy making purposes. And we have, all, we have already covered the reasons for it. Because at times we, we fail to identify our priorities because of other limitations, and that's why we are not doing research which might be needed as per our local needs or priorities. So that remains a challenge. So um, as my project revolves, uh, is focused on research ethics uh, review, so um, in this slide, I would like to give you an overview how the uh, research ethics review is organized in Pakistan. So uh, at the first level, all the research studies they need a prior review by institutional research ethics committees or institutional review boards. And we can call them IRBs for the purpose of uh, ease uh, in, remaining my, in, in my remaining talk. So um, the, the research ethics committees, these are very important because most of our research is reviewed by institutional review boards. And institutional research is, um, is only reviewed by institutional uh, review board. They are not reviewed by the next two um, uh, items which I have put, put on my slides. So this, this indicates that why IRBs are important, the IRBs which are situated within the institutions, because most of our research would be reviewed by these. And then comes National Bioethics Committee. Research Ethics Committee of National Bioethics Committee is, is, is the body which is, um, which is responsible to keep an oversight of research ethics. Um, it is also expected to, to have a oversight of IRBs, but uh, we, we, we are not complying to that at the moment. And National Bioethics Committee, of course, it is the, it is the committee which is responsible for, uh, uh, for upholding ethical principles in all sectors of uh, healthcare delivery. And through its research ethics committee, it is uh, reviewing research, re uh, research projects. The projects which are national level or which do have an international collaborator or the drug trials. These three categories are, are the research projects which are reviewed by our research ethics committee of the national level. And the drug trials, they are also reviewed by Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. So this is how our research ethics review framework works. During COVID-19, uh, COVID our uh, research ethics committee of NBC, they have developed a system which is called rapid turnover review. Uh, and uh, this was to uh, respond to the need of ethics review. Because uh, during COVID-19, we witnessed a surge in research studies. Uh, and while most of the things were at hold, uh, there were lockdowns and most of the things were not working, uh, the research ethics committees, they were bombard, bombarded with a proliferation of research. And to meet those uh, requirements, uh, NBC has developed this guideline. And what they aim through this, they were, uh, they were giving its first review within 72 hours of the submission of the research studies. So, so this is very important. This development was very important. It guided ethics committees within the institutes as well. And this was in line with the emerging uh, uh, guidance as well. So, however, if you look at it, what is lacking is that the local IRBs, the institutional IRBs, they are not part of this of the system. And that is the time when local IRBs, they just felt overwhelmed because uh, they were facing the challenges of reviewing research studies, which were focused on research, uh, which were focused on COVID-19. And at the time, we knew 
very little about COVID-19. And there was no sufficient safety data as well as efficacy data to, to um, make our decisions about the research proposals that we were reviewing. And that was a challenge. And at the time, the IRBs, they felt overwhelmed and they felt like we want to reach out to other IRBs and we wanted to reach out to the NDC as well. And that is when uh, we, we started this, uh, this initiative, which, which I like to call is like Pakistan Ethics uh, Review Framework. So we initiated the project and the title of the project is Developing a Policy Statement and Recommendation for Pakistan's Ethic, Ethics Review Framework and IRBs in support of public health emergency preparedness and response. And at this time, um, many representative of IRB, IRBs within Pakistan, researchers, and other stakeholders, they came together and they were joined by international support. The support was provided uh, by the Global Health Network, by CHSR and GCP Alliance, and there were other colleagues as well uh, from around the globe who joined us as international advisory board. And we, what we did was we wanted to do an in-depth inquiry of, um, of the local context and the current structures and practices and the way NBC, REC, and local IRBs responded to the pressures of COVID-19. And in this initiative, what we did, we, we did extensive evidence gathering exercises so we did a series of workshops. We did a scoping review of literature, and we also do a limited capacity mapping of research ethics committees across Pakistan. So in the next few slides, what I'll do is I will talk a bit about these uh, evidence gathering exercises, uh, how we did this. However, the results, I would just summarize them at the, at the end. So I will not give you results of each individual activity that we have done. So I'll, I'll present all the results at the end. So just going through the evidence gathering exercises that we have done under this, in this project. So firstly, what we did was we, we organized an international workshop. And in this workshop, we wanted to, to look um, across our borders. We wanted to see how different countries they have responded to COVID-19 and how they have adapted their ethics review framework because we wanted to see that how others are doing and we wanted to learn from their practices. So uh, you can see the, uh, the contributors um, uh, who contributed in this, in this workshop. And uh, one of the remarkable feature and one of the remarkable learning from this workshop was that the, um, the countries which, which had a centralized uh, research ethics framework, they responded better because um, we, we understood that your baseline um, ethics review framework is going to shape how you are going to respond during a public health emergency. And the ones who have a centralized uh, system, they are, of course, they, they have a advantage of responding in, in, a, in a more coordinated way. So uh, in this international workshop, uh, 171 participants joined us from 46 countries. And following that, we did a workshop focused on Pakistan, and uh, its title was Ethics Review Framework uh, in Pakistan during COVID-19. So um, in, this ethics, in, in this workshop, we not only invited ethics review committees, we also invited researchers as well as policymakers. And we did invite our key stakeholders we invited uh, our uh, Professor Zulfikar Bhutta, who has been uh, longest serving chair, uh, founding chair of National Bioethics Committee of Pakistan. We also invited our current chair, who is Dr. Sai Mike Pal. Uh, and, and we also invited representatives from the government as well. And the, the format of, the meet, uh, of this workshop was we invited them to provide us with the situational summaries. And following that, we, uh, we generated a discussion with using open-ended uh, open open questions as well as poll. So uh, this is how we did this. And um, as second, uh, or, and the most important um, evidence gathering activity was, we wanted to have a look at the national level um, uh, literature. And we thought that a, a scoping review of literature would be the best strategy 
to see that what is the evidence uh, or what is what does this literature say about the research ethics framework of Pakistan. So, of, of course, we wanted to have a look at the existing national literature in order to gain insights into, into the development of ethics review in Pakistan. And what we have did here, we have used a time frame to allow us to include the time when we witnessed uh, the emergencies in the history of Pakistan, the earlier emergencies. So we have reviewed the uh, research ethics review framework starting from 2005, because 2005 and 2010, they, they, these two years, we witnessed uh, public health emergency, uh, we, um, emergencies which were conf confined to Pakistan primarily. So we wanted to include that literature and that's why we use these timelines and we used our scoping uh, methodology for this. Um, and yes, and as we uh, continue to gather our insight, with, with the help of the emerging uh, with gathering insight, we developed uh, uh, a survey tool. And, and using the survey tool, what we did was we did a capacity mapping of IRBs. So it, this survey tool was, uh, was in, uh, adapted from a tool that was used by Sitzer already. And we used that uh, in a WHO funded project as well. So uh, with the help of our collaborators, we were able to use this survey tool. And, and the survey tool allowed us to, to examine the baseline uh, competencies of the IRBs and also how they have adapted uh, during COVID-19 and what are the challenges that they have faced during COVID-19. And we also try to, to, to look at the, uh, the potential solutions. The IRBs would, would think that th this could be something which would ease their work or which would address the challenges that they are facing. So in, in, this, um, in this diagram, uh, or uh, I have like put together all my uh, findings, but let's not concentrate. This is too busy a slide. So I'll cover these in my next slides. So, um, so this, is, this is important to note that the, uh, the advent or, or the development or the initiation of Pakistan Ethics Review Framework dates back to like 2004 and 2005, that was the time when research, uh, globalization of research was witnessed around the globe. And that was the time when National Bioethics Committee was formulated uh, under the directive of uh, government of Pakistan. However, at that time, there was no formal directive to set up institutional review boards. However, it was like the members of the medical community who took a lead and they were the ones uh, uh, and as well as the research institution who took, who took a lead and they go on to establish institutional review boards within their institution. And the prime focus for them or the prime gain for them was that we wanted to, to remain eligible for the international collaboration opportunities as well as funding opportunities. So, and, and yes, this is important to, to note that why um, the Pakistan Ethics Review Framework started to establish um, there is no mechanism uh, for IRBs to communicate with each other as well as with the national bioethics committees. So the challenge for us was the ethics committees, they continue to, to work under silos. Um, there is no uh, list available uh, of all the IRBs which are in the country. And, they, and due to that, we even do not know where these silos exist. There is no comprehensive data to tell us that how uh, to tell us or enable us to comment on the competencies of these uh, IRBs. So if um, um, this is how I would like to um, frame my problem statement. So uh, based on the learnings uh, of, of the evidence gathering exercises that we have done, the problem statement is Pakistan's nascent national ethics review system is barely two decades old and while functional at national level, does not as yet have strong provincial counterparts, as well as local research ethics committees or institutional review boards. We came across knowledge gaps as well as challenges. So let's have a look at the knowledge gaps. So the first thing is that we had a dearth of published literature focused on research ethics. Uh, we used our timeframe starting from 2005 to, to 2022 
and we were able to identify only nine studies which substantially focused on research ethics review framework. Um, as I said earlier, list of all IRBs in Pakistan is not publicly available. It is not easy or possible to collect this information. Uh, and I, I already covered that there is no comprehensive empirical data to comment on competencies of IRBs in Pakistan. During public health emergencies, no formal mechanism of coordinated ethics review among diverse bodies involved in ethics review in Pakistan existed. And this is something the world has learned from previous emergencies that during emergencies, there is the role of coordinated and cooperated ethics review, especially for multi-center and international clinical research. So here I have uh, listed down the challenges that, that we have identified. So our National Bioethics Committee, it has all the competences, but it lacks patronage, it lacks resources, as well as funding to do the job. It, it, it has a overarching responsibilities, but it does not have resources to, to um, meet its mandate. There is no mechanism to assess, survey, audit, register, or inspect IRBs at national level. Most members of IRB lacks formal training to implement their mandate. Variable or questionable practices of IRBs have been reported in the literature. Uh, most of the institutions in, in Pakistan, they do not have human research programs or formal mechanism for training their researchers. So IRBs continue to function without any training, guideline, or SOP during COVID-19, and of course, they face challenges. So, um, and, and this is important to note that all the literature that identified these challenges, they also offered some solutions. They have been calling uh, for, there, there have been calls for action, but the problem is that in spite of the call of action, which has been reported in the literature in 2005, there are no visible or significant actions have been taken. So, so this leads us to, us to conclude that research ethics review framework remains a neglected area. So um, here we, this is how we would like to frame our options um, to address the identified challenges. The first recommendation uh, this initiative would like to make is we need to develop harmonized ethics review. So uh, the first recommendation is develop comprehensive guidance for ethics, ethics review that are adhered to across the ethics review system of Pakistan to enable harmonized ethics review. Um, second recommendation we make is we need to strengthen governance structure by provision of sufficient resources. And the good news is that we, we just heard yesterday, Dr. Saima Prabhu is talking about these things that uh, there are some initiatives in place and, uh, and we are hoping that uh, there is some action um, equal to this um, recommendation. We also feel that we need to develop synergies and line of communication between IRBs as well as National Bioethics Committee, Research Ethics Committee and the R Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan. Of course, optimal training is something that we need we make a recommendation to develop or plan how to optimize training opportunities as per the needs of Pakistan. The next recommendation we make is that research institutions must develop human research programs and commit to provide support and training to its researcher in addition to IRBs. So this is important. We do not need to train only the IRBs. We need to train our researchers and we need to provide support for them. Because if they, they do not have any support and they have a pressure to produce research output or publish papers, they, they are forced to cut the corners. And uh, especially for the public health emergencies, the recommendation we make is that we need to develop guidance for ethics review during public health emergencies. And we need to use some mechanisms of coordinated reviews among the diverse bodies which are involved in ethics review. Of, uh, of, a, of a single research study. So uh, yes, so this is all about my, uh, uh, this initiative. And at this um, uh, slide, I would like to recognize the contributors and the collaborators. And I would like to thank um, all of them, uh, especially the Global Health Network, as well as the Good Clinical Practice Alliance Europe, 
uh, an initiative for developing capacity of ethics research in, uh, in lower middle income countries. Um, and at the last, I would like to thank all of you for, for being patient and uh, being with me for, for last few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. So over to Maria. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah. This is, um, this is such important work. And I think that uh, um, it is one of the, uh, yours is one of the only two projects from Pakistan, uh, which has looked at this indeed. Um, and I think we were, we were discussing with the chair of the National ERC as well, that perhaps it's time to like, come together um, as, a, as a community of research ethics reviewers uh, and maybe take this forward into making these policy recommendations. And, and it was also great to hear from the chair of the National ERC in our session yesterday that they are also working towards the same objective of a tradition of local IRBs and of you know, providing greater training to IRB members um, um, and also um, towards greater oversight of research across Pakistan. Um, okay, so um, we are now moving. Um, we are um, we are super on time. Uh, so and we are moving on to uh, the most important part of this discussion, which is um, uh, the group discussion towards um, an assessment of uh, our needs for health capacity, uh, health research capacity building. Uh, before uh, and I know that there are um, you know participants who have joined us online. Um, and and there are a few questions as well. Uh, some of these were taken up by Salvia, but we can you know discuss these again as well. Thank you, Salvia, for you know keeping an eye out for those. Um, uh, so before we start our discussion and before we share um, the very preliminary results that we have from our audience feedback today and some of the registrations online, I'd really like uh, Professor Trudy to share her uh, perspective because. Um, you have worked a lot in um, research capacity building in low middle income countries. And because you have a truly global perspective, uh, what has been your, in your experience, what are the top three challenges uh, for health research capacity building in Pakistan and um, uh, in low middle income countries like Pakistan? And what do you think um, such countries need to do in order to change that? Well, thanks, Mary. Great question. Um, and um, just thank you all again for your participation in this session and um, and your contribution so far. It's just just so exciting to hear. And and um, and that last presentation, I think, summed it up. Um, so top three challenges. I think um, there is a, a cycle to overcome around um, having truly embedded teams where you've got the ability to. Um, to apply for grants, conduct high quality research, um, and then win grants for doing so. And it's getting over that, um, that hurdle. Um, and, and so how do you win um, these really significant grants? It's, it's by having that whole ecosystem of skills in place to, um, to apply and then win. So research regulations in your country is really important. The ability to manage grants, um, run teams and um, do the project management, which I know your office is really um, skilled in doing and trying to accelerate that across the country. Um, so I think those the three things would be highly connected. And I also think there's um, it, it's around research operations and bringing them together. So I think data science is very important, which Frank talked about earlier. I think good research laboratories is really important. And then I'd say good research operations and that those research operations support every type of health research study, not just clinical trials. Um, and if so, if you get those three things right, you good research operations, good laboratories, and um, really strong data science, um, then you're able to um, be in internationally competitive and, and, and win grants to go forward. And I hope that um, uh, we can make, play just a small part in uh, helping connect excellence and, and, and really grow that ability. Um, across your, your um, component teams. Thank you. Professor Trudy, um, this was, um, this was a, a wonderful summary of the needs. Um, and I think that all of us here and online and those who have not joined us today would agree with, uh, um, you know, there's a strong consensus on what you have just uh, uh, summarized for us. 
um, I was just taking a look at our responses um, uh, of the you know attendees in this classroom today. Many of these have had to leave because um, so uh, between one to two p.m. in Pakistan in our um, hospital is a protected teaching time. So many people were able to join us initially, but now that the clinics and you know all the clinical work has started again. Uh, post lunch break many people have had to leave but i have had several messages that people are interested in you know continuing this conversation and um, the registration form that we had used online for um, this meeting uh, we had also posed it to our on site attendees who were you know with us in the classroom around one and um, i was taking a look at the fill forms uh, and i think they are around um, uh, 50 or 60 forms with us. I haven't uh, like totaled the number yet. Um, and there's a there's a strong, um, uh, you know, uh, of overwhelming number, which has mentioned um, uh, the need for protected time for research. Uh, and then uh, the need for, um, you know, resources to operationalize research, which you have also mentioned. And then of course, funding. Um, and then, um, very importantly, um, and um, uh, and I, I was actually very happy to read it, the need for good communication in research with both your with your patients and um, you know with other researchers and reviewers, of course. Um, so, so this has been what we have seen, um, you know, uh, in that. Uh, some responses also indicated, and I'm sure Frank would be very happy to see that, uh, the importance of having good data and collecting the right data for research. Um, so um, yes, so, so and, and then of course, research related education, um, you know, education about research methodology and, you know, other aspects of research, including data management. Um, uh, there have been many responses that also indicated the importance of uh, strong networking uh, by those who are stakeholders within a particular area of research. So, uh, so that has been the audience response so far. Um, at this point, I'd like both the on-site and the online attendees. Um, so our two main questions are that, what is your opinion or what is in your opinion, the, the commonest challenges for doing high quality health research in Pakistan? And what do you think um, can be done to change this? So uh, if there are any on-site um, comments, otherwise we can check if there are any online comments about that. Dr. Romina, would, would you like to say something? And then I'll come to you, Asa. So Dr. Romina is a molecular biologist um, and um, uh, you know the NGS person at our hospital, um, and she's going to be sharing her views. Thank you very much, Mariam. Um, Hi, so as she introduced me, I'm Rumina, and I'm a, a section head of molecular diagnostics, which entails um, all the molecular tests as well as, a, as well as cytogenetics and others. So when I talk about molecular tests, that means anything that deals with any kind of disease that uh, comes from infectious diseases or genetics or anything like, or cancer. Um, so because I have a PhD in molecular biology, so I'm a researcher as well. I used to work on basic uh, proposals in the US, uh, but now I'm strictly um, just doing my diagnostics because uh, we don't have enough space to do research, which is one of my weaknesses. The areas that I think that uh, need help in um, resource limited country like ours are two things. Number one is the the human uh, capacity building, uh, because we do have, um, sometimes we do have, for example, if I come from a diagnostic point of view, um, we have a very uh, nice international standard lab and equipment as well, but then we do not have that training where we could apply that, um, you know, for interpretation of the very complex testing for cancer patients. So that kind of uh, limitation uh, limits our diagnostic uh, capability as well. Um, so there is a lot that we can do um, bringing on research so that basic research can be applied in the country like ours, which is genetically different 
from the rest of the world, mostly like uh, uh, because, because of consanguous marriages, genetics are different. And therefore, um, we definitely need help in um, you know, training for our capacity building in the complex testing, not the basic, which, which, are, which we are already doing. Um, then there is a limitation of uh, resources in terms of bringing the equipment, even if we have uh, the capacity to uh, use them, but we have resources limited that we cannot uh, you know, bring that to the labs. So we need those kind of resources as well. Then the major um, um, uh, stumble for our research is that we don't have a nice, a huge um, granting bodies in Pakistan. And uh, Shaukat Hanam being a cancer research hospital, uh, they do not uh, you, uh, take this as a university research um, area. Therefore, we are um, unfortunately not capable of uh, seeking or um, getting the uh, higher education commission uh, grants so that is why our research is limited and we definitely need funding that area as well so whatever comes to me next time i'll bring but these are the main areas that i would like um thank you dr Romina. i think these are um anyone working in uh, diagnostics um, in pakistan would agree uh, to what you have just shared um um are there any responses or further comments to that? Just so uh, Dr. Irfan Ahmed is going to be sharing his views. Uh, he's a hepatobiliary surgeon at Shaukat Khanum. Thank you very much. Sorry, I could not come earlier. I was busy in, operate, uh, uh, in operation theater. So healthcare research is mainly done by either clinicians or basic science researchers. So in Pakistan, there is a big disconnect between uh, clinicians and basic science researchers, they don't talk to each other. So I think that's one thing which is missing. So we need to build those bridges between uh, clinicians and basic science researchers. I've spoken to both of them and I had lots of SNAP surveys asking them what the problems are. Now clinicians are under pressure to produce papers, but they produce papers just looking at local data, some retrospective studies, but they don't reach out to basic scientists. Basic scientists are looking for problems which they can actually work to address but they don't get that feedback from clinicians. So I feel that communication bridge need to be developed. And I think that will push lots of things forward. As far as grants are concerned, I was surprised to hear how many grants universities get, but the research dies in universities. It doesn't come to the, uh, to, 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 from bed to bench. So it, the bench to bed and bed to bench uh, transition is not there. But I've, I've, I, I think that needs to be discussed and encouraged. And I feel lots of problems can be resolved by talking to each other. Can I, can I jump in there? Because that is such a brilliant point. And in fact, um, the, the World Health Organization um, have a new uh, group. So the deputy DG of the WHO is a lady called uh, Sumya Samanathan, who I'm sure many of you have heard of. And she runs a new group called um, Research for Health. And um, so Tedros put her in place to do exactly what you've just articulated so beautifully, that um, their mission is that there should be research in every healthcare setting. And, and she talks about research systems and health systems. And it's exactly that. We have to bridge the gap between health research and healthcare delivery. And it shouldn't be these two very distant camps and that research is you know, often seen in many of the places where I, I go and give workshops and work with groups. Research is seen as something you do within your medical training as a clinician or a nurse. Um, it, you do a small project and then it's forgotten and it, it doesn't happen automatically within healthcare settings. It's left in universities and there isn't that connecting up. And this is what we have to change. We have to build a research culture um, and also a, um, enabling of research in healthcare settings that hospital managers and, uh, and ministers of health um, actually support research as being part of healthcare delivery. And, and I think it's up to countries um, such as Pakistan to work out exactly how that can be nurtured in the healthcare systems. Um, and, and I hope some of the things we've talked about today, having research clubs, um, bringing people together to share their expertise can make it really efficient and just you know change that culture of it being a very distant, different and separate thing. So that was really well said and I really 
appreciate you bringing up that point. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to work with the WHO as a collaborating centre. Um, and having the Global Health Network Pakistan um, officially set up today, you are part of that WHO collaborating centre and mission. And, we, and I hope we can all work together to change that. So thank you. Really great point. Yes, indeed. Dr. Farah also had a comment. Um, yes, thank you so much. So I would uh, like to build further on what Dr. Irfan said and, and Professor Trudy said. So uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, clinicians have a pressure to publish. And if they have a pressure to publish, uh, they can produce easy papers like doing a retrospective study, which is underpowered, may not be have a the robust methodology, or which is really answering a needed question or which is needed to make an impact. So what happens then? The other situation is they, they are doing a, a research which is essentially asking a question that is really needed to be answered or like asking the right question or doing a study which would make an impact. But because they have a pressure uh, to publish, they do not have time. At times, they may not have, the clinicians especially in Pakistan, they do not have the required training in research, know-how of doing a good research. So they might be motivated, but because they, they lack the training, they might be afraid of doing a research or asking for help in methodology. That, 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 could, that could be one reason. Uh, so, so in that case, uh, the only uh, rescue for them is like produce some easy paper why they are not motivated to do the research that is needed uh, because they do not have support to do that. If they would be doing research, they would need to you know, do uh, huge paperwork. They might need to deal with IRBs uh, and they find it quite hard. Uh, they might need to get like their data uh, transfer agreements. They might need to talk to their legal colleagues. They might be af afraid of that. We do not have support for that, you know, and and we have already discussed it. Like the the human resources, there is a disproportionate human resources. Uh, we are producing very good doctors, very uh, great clinicians, but the support team uh, is not there who can handle uh, the other work. And and it's not just that we are not producing them because of by, uh, lack of the trainings. If there are some trainings available within Pakistan, as well as there are foreign trainings, but they might not be motivated to go to those career paths because the career would be a difficult one. There are no career uh, progression uh, prospects. So that, that's another challenge. Uh, so so, uh, so this, this is like just to elaborate on what you said. And I'm, I'm so happy that you mentioned disconnect. So the research in, in this scenario, they are doing research that is being done in silos so researcher is doing research disconnected with the policy, policy makers, uh, uh, the researchers. So and 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 the researchers are not asking or calling uh, for attention uh, to change uh, to, to to change this and why they are not making an impact or why they are not calling for action because. Um, there are no uh, active consortia, disease-specific groups, consortia. Uh, so government is not asking them how the government can support them. And then the physician investigators and the clinicians, because of all the reasons that we just mentioned, they just lack the capacity to, um, to you know, uh, lobby with the government to, to highlight what is needed uh, to, to you, know, uh, you know, address this challenges or for, for the better situation. So, um, and, and this lack of collaboration, um, this, this disconnect, this just lowers our prospect of being viewed as like uh, research hubs. So that is like a, a really uh, big disadvantage. So just to build on, on what you said, and thank you for mentioning that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. Dr. Hanna, I'll come to you next. I can see your. Is it done? Nati, I think you mentioned very valid points because I, I look at uh, this as a clinician. So, so it's all about financial gains later on in your career. 
So if you're a clinician, you're a good clinician, you can earn a lot of money by practicing. But if you're a good researcher and a clinician, your financial incentives are not going to be there. I think that that is a barrier because that financial reward later on in the career do not exist. So, so clinicians will produce two or three papers which is required, draw a line, and then they move on. So, so that, that's where the lack of motivation or incentive comes in. Second thing is there's no protected time for research. So our trainees are expected to work 52 hours a week, all clinical work, and they do research when they go home out of their family time. So it is again de-incentivizing those people. So resources on ground, and then later on some financial incentive, uh, because we don't have an academic clinician, clinician jobs. Either you become an academic or you become a clinician. And good boys and girls who are clever, they would like to be clinicians because that will pay more. Um, I would like to say that you just said they are the good boys and girls. So what, what about those who are not uh, like pursuing their clinical career? So, so yeah. They end up like us. Yes. <laughs> they, they are a rare breed. Like yeah, they're a rare breed. Yes. Those people do not actually, so, so that there are two different pathways, uh, research and clinical practice. But the problem is they don't combine. Some people are researchers, they just go purely into research but move away from clinical activity. And the clinicians, they actually move away from research completely. So in their daily practice, if you look outside Shafat Panam, it is quite bad really. Clinicians do not get involved in research at all. Because Unless it's for their promotion requirements or as part of their training requirements. Uh, that's a different discussion. We had a yeah. bit of a chat yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. But then because they're under pressure, they will try to produce very quick papers because here papers are not counted as impact factor number of citation. It's a number. So you need to produce one, two, and three paper. So you can produce them in an open open review journal where you can just pay the money and get published. That still counts. How to change it? Like one thing or two things, how the change I think it will happen from the medical school, from the medical school, because that's when you start telling people about research. You need to make research attractive and enjoyable because that's something which they enjoy. When they see the practice is being changed because of research and they take pride in it, that's when they start enjoying it. Absolutely. They're not producing papers for the mm -hmm. sake of papers. And, and just very briefly, uh, one of the things that is uh, emerging a lot out of research integrity literature uh, mm -hmm. is three things. First, that institutions need to not just uh, reward publication numbers. That's the that's the a key thing to change research culture. And the second key thing to change research culture at both institutional and national level is to have defined priorities as per local needs. Because if you're not researching on things that are your priorities, you're just doing it for yourself uh, to read certain publication numbers. And that's when there'll be greater tolerance for you know research taking some time. Um, that's what I talk, talk to doctors all the time. And I said, you can produce a paper in two hours. You can write a letter to editor. And that counts as a publication. So, but but a big clinical trial would take five, 10 years of work to produce one paper. So, so we can't compare oranges, oranges with peers. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Dr. Farhana had her hand up for some time. If you would like to add here, uh, should I unmute? Oh, you have uh, unmute. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me, Dr. Mariam? Yes, yes, we can, Dr. Farhana. Please go on. Okay, okay. Okay, I agree with what uh, Dr. Irfan and Dr. Farah have said. Uh, clinicians are very busy people. Uh, they, they usually don't have time to do research. They don't have any protected time related to that. And, uh, but they are expected to do research. It becomes a part of their appraisal. And it's like uh, in this calendar year or in these 12 months, you have to do it. Secondly, uh, they expect uh, people in other departments, especially in clinical research office and cancer registry to do the data collection for them. And I'm, I'm not uh, uh, saying that their approach is incorrect because they don't have time. Uh, they have not been given enough resources to do the research, but again, they are expected to complete it. So uh, when the burden comes to the clinical research office, they can handle it to some extent. 
and uh, because they don't have enough, uh, again, manpower or they don't have enough resources to do it. And when it comes to my department, which is called Cancer Registry and Clinical Data Management, uh, how can we do it? Because that is not our primary job to conduct research. Our primary job is to do cancer registration, be it hospital cancer registration or population-based cancer registration. And we have done that once or twice in the recent years. Perhaps we have done uh, a lot in the past. That is, we have helped the clinicians, but we, uh, uh, because I oversee that department, I realize that it has become very difficult over the years to handle their tasks as well and our tasks as well. So uh, where do we where do we start then? And uh, and it doesn't end over there. And when I say or Dr. Farah say it's not possible for us to handle this data uh, interviewing the patients or data collection or data entry into the software, when we say we don't have enough time, the distance between the clinicians and uh, the cancer registry staff or the clinical research staff also increases. So we just pass by one another at times as if, you know, uh, because we have said we can't do it. So it is a very difficult, it's not an easy situation over here. And as for me, uh, uh, my primary job is cancer to oversee cancer registration, medical coding. And the staff, and we have four or five senior members, they are the ones struggling to oversee all the reports and cancer registration and the National Cancer Registry, the Punjab Cancer Registry and the Northwest Cancer Registry. And the demand is to increase cancer registration into two or three districts of uh, Punjab every year to do that. How can that be possible? But, uh, you know, it's it's a dilemma. I have not been able to fix this. I have attempted it in every way, but uh, perhaps you people can uh, uh, suggest a way for it because uh, uh, I don't uh, I don't know what to do about it. I've spent years and years thinking about it, how to go about, but it hasn't helped much. Over to you. Yeah, that's a very important point, Dr. Fahana, and resource limitation and constraints are a big problem. Uh, I see that uh, Munawar Saab has, a, has his hand raised. Uh, so let's take his comment. Perhaps he wants to add to that. G. Munawar yeah, good, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you for inviting this. Such a wonderful session. It's a very interactive session, and all the points are very well by the uh, consultants. Actually, I belong to a CRO industry since quite a long time. And, and we can understand that the, we, we cannot expect everything from the clinicians and the consultants, uh, especially in the oncology field. So for that, we have a separate budget for the study coordinators. Uh, I also raised a question in the beginning that if we need a support from the site as well in terms of the staff, like what challenges as a CRO we are facing here? <clears throat> we are facing here that the hospital are failed to retain the study coordinator for the study time duration. They usually hire a trainee or the fellow students. And once they complete their fellowship, they, they go away from the site. That hit the study, you know, milestone. So we requested sites to onboard a dedicated staff, a research coordinator for the, the specific uh, departments. And as a CRO or as a sponsor, what we looking for on the sites, we look the if, if the site has all the capabilities like PI, SABI, and the study coordinator, phlebotomist, nurse. So we are responsible to train the staff, plus we are responsible to cover the budget of their staff as well, according to the involvement of the study. We just need your support in terms of the minimize the timeline because you know. If I if I compare Pakistan with other countries, so we are just covering 0.5 percentage of the international market share of the research. So, but, but this COVID is blessing these guys for us. It opened so many forums and platform for other research activities, and we are uh, we are managing so many clinical trials in Pakistan with the collaboration of the uh, uh, global sponsor. So we are happy to assist all the clinicians and hospital here. We are doing some capacity building training as well. We are, we are training the staff on the good documentation and the GCP practice just to assure the outcome of the site as per the compliance of the GCP that is required by the sponsor and the regulatory body. We just required your time uh, because in internationally, uh, I think uh, the we have a special uh, speakers as well, the special speakers, they can second me. 
the timeline is the most important thing for us why pakistan lose some tries because uh, we are not committing the timelines so like we have a parallel uh, change or chain of uh, you know the regulatory approvals first irb irb submission is a long process from the hospitals like gci is a plus hospital so we can we we have to work to minimize this number one number two we can go for the parallel submission for nbc and irb just to uh, minimize the time difference because both are taking care of ethics and then we'll go for the draft that 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 take three months of time as per their recent guidelines and then import license approval so all together we are anticipating a, a decision between a six months of timeline so as compared to other southeast asia countries where the malaysia philippines they are heading up you know they are making all the approvals just within a two months of timeline all approvals irb national basic committee or the draft within two months of timeline they are initiating the studies so it's a win-win situation for both of them like we cannot you cannot blame the sponsors alone that we are not supporting to the sides in terms of the capacity building in terms of the team development and in terms of the infrastructure it also you know uh, not coming blame on the investigator sides like they are not giving us time so we need to work together and we need to set a, a, you know a, a diagram like uh, currently we are working with alhan hospital since last 3 years and i am happy to share that alhan is the site who is managing iqvr six trials six multinational studies the reason why we are comfortable with them because once we approach them they this they quickly assign a dedicated team for us that minimize the risk of the timelines uh, deviations they go with the irb approval and get all the approval done within a month and then we'll proceed for the nbc and the draft approval so we request all the other sites to come up with the same approach have a dedicated team for this you need to invest in a first and you need to give a support to your investigators i i second uh, the 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 consultants who are sitting here they are very busy guy they used to busy with the opds and the operation center they do not need to you know follow with the sponsor and the funding agencies for that you do yes. you, you so, have a dedicated department yes so so definitely streamlining the conduct of clinical trials or any health research in pakistan is certainly very important um and i completely agree uh, with uh, what you propose regarding that to you know streamline and make processes more coherent um I, i do have some some thoughts related to this but i'll park these for now and i'll i'll bring these up again uh, i'd like to take a comment from dr irfan yusuf now um, um dr irfan yusuf is a clinician at chakot khan but he's also the um, head of our medical education committee in fact it is with his kindness that we were able to like uh, secure uh, this uh, and plan this whole event at at a very short notice thank, thank you, you for that also uh, Uh, well, I'm, I'm a neurosurgeon, and uh, when I joined Shaka Khanum, um, I really found it very difficult to produce any clinical research, you know. And I was asked, "Why am I not doing it?" And my answer was, "I don't have the time uh, or capacity to collect data, number one, and then you know, do some meaningful uh, clinical research." Uh, and I, I continued to say no for a couple of years until I had more residents and fellows who were working with me, uh, and and then I had the liberty of you know devoting some time to this exercise. Uh, number two, uh, what I realize in Pakistan is that we have a disconnect between our uh, medical schools, uh, medical universities that we have now uh, in abundance in Lahore, uh, and then the medical schools. Uh, and then the clinical service providers which are the hospitals uh, so you know the clinicians actually come up with problems but that has to trickle uh, down to the very basic science uh, aspects of it uh, which are the universities uh, and research institutions that we have so i, I think it's a matter of establishing uh, uh, number one a culture of research uh, having uh, problems that need to be researched and produce uh, clinical solutions for that so it's it's quite an uphill task for us uh, but i think that's where the global network comes in uh, we can tap into their resources and then see how other countries are going about it thank you yes please um just following on to that comment and i talked about incentivizing uh, clinicians to do research 
we can incentivize them by awarding them degrees, MD degree, MS degree, or PhD degrees. Uh, I've tried to establish entrepreneurial PhDs where clinicians can go into research, produce something which is innovative, which might go into market as, as, a, as a marketable product and can produce some financial incentive both for universities, institutions, and clinicians. I think I've, I've not made a lot of progress in that idea. And I think that's what I would like global network to, to help us developing these type of degrees to incentivize clinicians so that they can have dedicated time for research, which will lead to a degree that's incentivization. And then this might lead to some breakthrough in science. So that entrepreneurial PhD is something which I've, I'm quite happy to talk about outside this forum. There's quite a lot of discussion, but I would like to have some help or guidance from the global network. Thanks. Uh, I, I'm really glad you just said that because just yesterday we were discussing setting up uh, degree programs for health research, specifically cancer research. So yes, we can certainly discuss that. So um, uh, in the time that we were discussing, the wonderful data scientist, Dr. Frank, has been able to like get the data from our online registrations. So let's have a look at what the online um, registries reflected in their uh, comments about challenges for health research. Um, and then we can continue our discussion further. So quickly, excuse the formatting. I was trying to just put everything on the slides uh, to just get insight. So uh, Mariam, working very closely with Salvia, produced a wonderful few questions for registrations and, and Dr. Farah. Um, they produce questions, so whoever was registering for this session, then they can tell us their experiences. And um, let's say this next. Um, oh, go to the next one, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so we had a total of 26 people who, um, who registered and responded, and they are all from uh, majority of, almost all of them from, from Pakistan. I think we have two and one from United Kingdom and the US. Go to the other slide top. Um, back to the first, to the, to the one before this. So the job roles, so uh, we had a good number of assistant professors. So we have all the cadres represented, uh, which is very good. Um, it, it's quickly just translating what we know to what could be actionable. So, and then um, next and next. And um, so this is what they do for research. So the, we have study coordinators, we have principal investigators, we have up to um, clinical researchers, basic science researchers, industry sponsor. So this is, is a diverse group that contribute to research. Next. And they, they have years of experience. So on the um, the sleeping horizontal axis, those are the years of experience. And on the vertical standing uh, axis, those are the year, the number of people in those years. They have years of experience. So um, four of them have at least twelve years of experience, and we have some who don't have much experience and some who have more than 20 years. So that's very good. And uh, next. Well, I don't think this is readable, but uh, we asked about what are the challenges. So the highest of all was trained staff. Uh, trained staff is the biggest problem. We have financial support. We have time constraints. We have... Um, competencies to research, registration, um, in trial units, uh, scars, uh, funding, um, love facilities. So all those are the challenges that came up top uh, of what really challenges researchers to, to perform research. And next. And uh, what are the priority areas? So I just tried to just crudely put whatever they said, so I didn't disaggregate, so no numbers. So people want to have good review committees, um, training of researchers, clinical trials, uh, research on medicines, medication error, and the irrational prescribing. 
So I think people are talking here about antimicrobial and the drug stewardship. Um, research on um, funct functional research offices, interdisciplinary research, uh, university industry linkages. I think Professor's just saying now what we're trying to link research to be able to incentivize um, our PhDs to be able to produce products that could go to market. It has to be incentivized for people to use it. Otherwise, why should they do research? So strengthen regulatory process, networking, linkages, timelines, good data practice, good clinical practice also are needed. More training on social sciences. This is very important. I wish you could train all data scientists, clinicians into social sciences because it's a foundation of what we work with every day. Um, uh, access to relevant grants and funding, defined clear, uh, HA process, I don't know HA process. Um, establishment of CTUs, breast radiology, healthcare professionalism, oh, health authority, okay. And next, I think we're coming to, to the end. And would you like to be involved? So this is an interesting thing. Whenever you ask people, would you like to be involved? Would you like to network and work with other groups? The answers are usually yes. Even yesterday, I think we had a very good roundtable discussion, and we think there are a lot of silos, and, but people are very willing to. I think we need to investigate what are, what are useful ways to network people, to bring people together. We might think we, we are very different, but when we sit on the same table, we're actually very similar. We're also just talking with Mercedes. The challenges you're mentioning here are almost similar challenges in Africa, in Latin America. But we as researchers or as scientists, we have an obligation to find out best mechanisms of also engaging other groups. And yes, I do agree, the Global Health Network comes in and we have Trudy on the line. We need to find, I think communities of practice have really worked so far in Africa and Latin America and some groups in Asia as well. We can explore how to expand them and make them user friendly. And yes, my sense. Yes, and that was the, end, and the, the last slide. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let's let's take her comment. Uh, oh, oh, uh, so Professor Trudy, if you could, um, I we realize you need to leave now. So if you could maybe share some parting thoughts with us, that would be great. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Frank. That was great. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm afraid I've got another meeting I've got to go to now, but um, it's just been so great to join you all today. And I'm really pleased we had the opportunity. Um, so much excellent um, comments and discussions coming on now. So I know we're going to we're going to uh, make sure we um, grab them all together and uh, and take these forward. I think those points around um, you know, making the environment um, attractive financially and winning grants, but also um, that whole piece around um, making research part of the um, environment for career development and, and, and incentivizing engagement with research is just so important. So, um, and, and these are exactly the same um, experiences in, in across the globe. Um, and so I hope we can make a difference by connecting groups up and finding some solutions to these things. So thanks very much for, um, for having us with you today. Um, Frank and Mercedes, I know, are really enjoying their time with you all. And um, Salvia, it'll be your, you and I will go next time, right? <laughs> we're joining you on, online, but um, we're, we're really uh, grateful to be part of it. So I'm going to duck out and, um, and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. And I look for, forward to hearing from my colleagues. And, but thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to have you with us today. Um, so before we move forward, um, I really wanted um, Selvia to comment on the discussion so far. Selvia, what are your thoughts on what we have discussed so far? I am so enjoying the discussions and especially uh, the ones coming from clinicians having, and I, and I wrote it in the chat, that uh, it totally resonates with me coming uh, from the clinical background myself. Um, I was, I was trained in India, 
um, and uh, I can say that I can see so many similarities in uh, in in the challenges that are being discussed. Uh, I can I can give you an example like when you say people being uh, people incentivizing research. So either uh, we have to think about the incentives, but when the incentives are there, say there is interest and enthusiasm, uh, the resources might not be present. And when the resources are available, then so they have to go hand in hand. I can I can share an example from my work. And uh, I was I was working in an ICU setup, and I was really encouraged by the consultant that I was working under to use the data that was available, the day-to-day uh, uh, observations that we made, as well as the the records, the patient records that we had over time, to use them as data for informing uh, guidelines or uh, treatment treatment protocols in the future. So that got me very enthusiastic. And we were looking up patient records and, okay, let's see, oh, maybe uh, it was so interesting because uh, it, it, it had never been, um, it had never been done before, but we were looking at the children's toe temperatures uh, to, uh, to inform uh, for a future uh, arrest. So, uh, you know, if we say that and it won't make sense to everyone here, but uh, it, it was just very uh, interesting for me. And I was very enthusiastic, but I was also very saddened because I didn't have the skills uh, to even uh, take up a research study to where would I go for, uh, you know, any kind of approval if I'm speaking directly to participants, where, how would I, how would I even uh, build a very good quality protocol? And I felt so helpless at that time because I didn't have the training. I mean, we did have a subject, the community medicine subject, but it was, it was hardly uh, sufficient for me to even design a study, to look up research papers, to even uh, make any sense of the literature that was out there. I had to get a master in public health degree to even uh, understand the basics of uh, clinical research. And I hope it doesn't have to be like that. I hope it is uh, built into uh, the curriculum, medical training, and uh, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe students who are really interested in research could take a year uh, and focus on uh, uh, public health or biostatistics, whatever they are interested in, and uh, go back to their clinical careers, but really be equipped with the skills and the and the training to uh, embed research into their clinical practice, which would be so helpful for the patients. Uh, it 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 can really open um, a different world. Uh, but I hope uh, we can we can build that into some kind of curriculum. But until then, uh, we have we can we can use what we have. We have the resources available on platforms uh, like the Global Health Network that we can introduce to the medical students and to the clinicians who are interested. So so they can they can utilize what we already have out there until we have something uh, formalized into the curriculum. Thank. Thank you so much. This is um, this is fascinating uh, share. Um, I oh hi hi good to see you. Uh, mic use the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just a comment that uh, what uh, Sylvia said to have one year off from your medical school to have research that would have been excellent. Like you can do that in the West. But we do not have that system in Pakistan, as I think you might have that in India too, that you cannot take off. The other thing is that, uh, you know, it is very important to have these embedded in medical school curriculum like research methodology, especially that now we are into future genetics and all that. We need to have uh, genomics very much in important to teach that to our medical students because. Uh, Future is all NGS, as I keep saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they don't know how to interpret the results or the reports, um, we cannot go yeah. anywhere. I, I do have some thoughts on that. But but again, I'll park these for now. Uh, yes, Dr. Natasha. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Mariam. And I, I'm, I will just be very, very quick because I know you, you need to move on to the next thing. I think what I've been listening to online, um, and I'm sorry I joined late, but what I've, what I've, the message that I'm getting across um, again and again, is the need for uh, some way to connect. And that word connection seems to be coming up again and again, whether it's connection between physician and basic scientist, whether it's a connection between funders and the research organization. So what happened at Chaka Khanam about um, uh, 15, 20, 15, 16 years back? Uh, maybe, you, okay, so 
Farhana Badr, Dr. Faisal Sultan, a few others got together and created a research support group. Mariam, okay. you were soon after that, you were part of that research support group. The research yeah. support group was actually envisaged to actually address all of these disconnects and to be a platform where people could connect. And it's really unfortunate for me to see that it's actually turned into a very procedural and a process oriented um, sort of platform rather than being a system, a system that enabled people to actually get the best out of research. Whether, and it was the reason to put it on the third floor was because you had the research office there, you had the basic wing, scientists yeah. there. So the, so the ecosystem that they were trying to develop, what is what the network is trying to do globally now was something that these guys were doing, you know, 15, 16 years back. And to me, I think what would be really interesting guys would be to look at the transition and the form and, and what's happened and where has it lost its yeah. vision. I think. Yeah, that like, like Frank also mentioned that it would be interesting to see uh, what are the barriers to yes. developing that connectivity. Yes, yes. yeah. Um, yeah. And so things I've, that prove a challenge. The discussion Doctor, yesterday it, was, was exactly this. The discussion yesterday was to try and understand even nationally why we have no, so people saying yes to the global health network. If I had put up a national question, if I had put up a national network and said, would you like to stay connected? I wonder how many people would have answered yes. So to international collaborations and to international uh, investigators, people will always say, yes, I want to stay connected because perhaps the incentivization and the reward is more than it is locally. But these are again things with which I think would be very fascinating to explore. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up this point. I think it's a very important point and I was trying not to talk about it, but now you've brought it up. Uh, the thing is, I think, these regulations or these governance structures are supposed to be there. I think they are, they are part and parcel of modern day research. The problem comes because researchers are not trained. They think as a, these as barriers. They think somebody is trying to stop them from doing research. So it requires training at a basic level because it's just a part of process. It's nothing more than a process, but that teaching in researchers is not there. And, and, and just because they think oh, I have to submit this, this uh, Base piece of paper, which they don't know how to write. So I try to develop research incubators here in, in our department, in which you can sit down, talk to them, uh, thresh the idea, which is good or not, bring out a research proposal, which is palatable for everybody, which smoothly go, goes through the system, because they will throw badly designed project to IRPs and to these committees, which will be spit back. And they, they think it's the fault of those, the governance structures. So, so to train them at basic level. I'm sorry, sorry. So what, what happens is that they're seen as adversaries and not as, as the same side, right? So they're seen, so I, if, I, if I may be allowed for her, I think I was known as the wicked witch of the IRB because I think I would be the person who was actually trying to pull out more of these issues in, in protocols, but it was never, it was never intended, and I think this is where dialogue between the reviewers and the investigators need to be more frequent. We explain why we have, and the other person has to be receptive and not defensive. So I think the defense comes. Researchers tend to, I'm a researcher, I, I tend to defend. It's not defend, it's justifying. I need to justify why I'm doing this. And that's the language, and that's exactly where the training comes in. You're absolutely right. It starts with training and we're coming back to where it starts, which is education and, and yeah. training physicians when they're being trained as physicians, the Dr. Ramina was saying. And, and, and also, also the, the, the whole culture the of whole research culture in of an research. organization yeah. in a country, because how pe people respond to criticism of their research is a reflection of it, that whole culture. Of the whole culture and becoming yeah. defensive about it. And this yeah. starts from, because we have no research policy in Pakistan. We have no research agenda in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And this is where Farah's comment about well, when we don't even have it set out for us, where do we start? Uh, yes, just further to build on uh, the comment related to IAB, it is so common to hear, IAB would not understand this, or they are crazy people. So, uh, <laughs> so this is so common to hear when you are serving on IAB, and, and this, this reflects the lack of training or the, the culture itself, that they need to they don't know how to respond to this, and 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 that is important. I think it's very. I think it's such an important 
But Mariam, this is so important. Why don't they want to be regulated? We had a lot of we had a lot of comments yesterday that we should make research easy. Research is not meant to be easy. It's meant to be research. But we're trying to make it easy, easy. Okay, let's let's make IRBs. Uh, if I'm giving my proposal to one IRB, I don't want five others to review it. Well, you know, it's it's about it's about again the researcher also. We need to get into their their heads and yeah. understand what yeah. is it. That's that and I think also, you know, um, uh, striking a balance between make streamlining the review process. Yeah. Uh, but also making sure, uh, so and making sure that it become it doesn't become too bureaucratic, but also like really changing the perception at the other end, uh, you know, reviewing uh, a review process as something that contributes to the quality of research. G. Uh, no, I think I think uh, the, the the thing is the training of researchers is so important because sometimes the the piece of research which comes to you is so badly written and so badly conduct, conducted. You have to spit it back, mm, yeah. and it's not 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 reflective on what they have done. They might have done a lot of work, but it's not put pro put together properly. So that's when when the teaching or training will come in at researcher level, mm. they will forward a properly conducted piece of paper to you, which will go through hurdles very easily, yeah. and then it will reduce work for everybody. So, so this is where yeah. some of the roles of IRBs has been debated, right? But maybe the the the, re the remit or the umbrella under which IRBs operate maybe should just extend beyond the review process. So IRBs essentially historically have been there to safeguard and to, you know, and to have this um, sort of check and balance and in ensure that we protect participants. But maybe our roles are also changing in terms of also trying to be um, guides for researchers that, okay, your pr protocol has come. We think it's a good study. But hey, let's work on it a little bit before we put it to the actual committee. So I think sometimes when you have resource limitations and you don't have research yeah. support or research clubs, maybe this is an extended uh, thing that, that, and I know you've tried to do it. I know you've tried to do it. I know that because I, I, I've seen it. So I think what you're doing is great that you try and look at these things before it goes to the full committee review. And I think that that's perhaps what other IRBs need to start doing too. Yes, yes. Uh, just to build. Okay, Dr. Okay. Irfan, you so go first. It becomes the responsibility of senior clinicians to do it at, at the clinical levels. And senior clinicians do not have time, they do not invest any time into this at all. Yeah, because but I think then it then it also, you know, so supervision and mentorship yeah. involves certain responsibilities. So if a trainee says that I do not have time for this, you provide protected time to that person. Mm -hmm. But if a supervisor or a mentor says that I am cutting corners because I don't have time, then, you know, they share a responsibility for not allocating time also. I think unfortunately uh, that generation, including myself, you have not come through that culture where research was part of your daily clinical practice. They will stand for eight hours supervising a trainee to do an operation, but they won't sit for an hour just telling them how to write a paper. So if we have a look at it, um, as we have just witnessed in this session, so I believe like 100% of attendees, they, they said yes, that they would like to be involved in this initiative, but they had to leave. They had to leave because there were other duties. So, and we are coming back to this, that they do not have time. And I would like to just build further on, on the comments related to IRB's job. So the problem is that uh, ethics and research ethics, of course, we do have like um, many of the research guidelines, uh, which, are, which are there to guide us. But nationally, um, ethics is research ethics is more like a national matter. My mentor used to say that it's a it's a national level matter because if we have a policy, if we have a research policy or research ethics review policy, only then we can have a strong ground to say that no, this review process or this review committee needs to work on these principles or procedures. If we lack that, we do not have a strong footing to, to you know, hold our ground, you know. In that case, and that is when uh, we, we get lots of pressure from, uh, from within the institute and from outside the institute. And I talked about the IRB shopping. Like if there are IRBs, which are approving a research and one of the IRBs is not approving that research. So, and, and this has happened to us that 
uh, we we were reviewing our protocol and we received um, a few messages which were telling us that this is only your institute that is which has hurdles. not approved which is like like thank you for saying hurdles which is like uh, putting hurdles uh, uh, in the uh, for this national level project and and you know that's not right so and then you feel a lot of pressure and it's like the job as a secretary to IRB is so hard because there are people they are saying that you need to you know just complete review for review of four studies in like one hour and you know <laughs> and you need to tell people that they do not say this they do not say this now they need to wrap up the discussion and they're and they, they are looking at you and the study teams are looking at you and then there are other other institutes and other pr uh, pressures which are telling you that you should do this mm. so in that case how we would empower IRBs if we have a national level policy that tells or that uh, sort of like sets out some principles mm. that this is how membership would be made this is how the IRBs can you know have been maintained so only then so, yes so one of the one Thank of the you. things that IRBs have tried to stay away from and this is internationally as well has been this idea of policing and, and, and stopping research. So if you give them a mandate that, you know, this is, uh, you know, so what people are a little worried about giving too much power to IRBs in that sense. IRBs knowing what their own individual mandate is, which is where we talked about the TORs and where we had an idea, but I think that comes from actually uh, building the IRB, training the IRB and constantly make, you know, just, the sort of the turnover in terms of the membership has to be evolving over time. But you, you talked about the shopping of the IRBs. One thing that um, I think the National Bioethics Committee is doing, which Saima mentioned yesterday, which is registration of national IRBs. Um, I'm just going to tell you about that genetic study because Dr. Romina mentioned gene, genome sequences. We're in a whole big kettle of fish now when you talk about genome genomic data and the fact that national uh, national exome data from over two, almost a quarter of a million Pakistanis is closed access and only available to that researcher who actually conducted that study. We have no access to it. Okay, as, as Pakistani researchers, we cannot access that, access that resource. Somebody passed that, some IRB passed that project and you're absolutely right. But this again comes down to your individual IRB's membership, uh, integrity, you know, who the composition and what their interest was in approving this. The intention of every research organization is output and, and, and publications. And I think that again is something that is going to, you know, it, it, we can't deny it. it. It obviously is a way for research organizations to exhibit their product, productivity is, is the output that they have. And it's a fine balance, isn't it? Between, you know, where, yeah. do, you, where do you create hurdles and where do you not create her? Yes, and I would like to quote her, one of our very senior um, leadership. Uh, his comment, ex his exact comment was, that we want to regulate research, but we do not want to over-regulate research because we need to understand the audience or the researcher. If he is not fully, you know, so, so that's like, a, yes, yeah. I would agree. It's a fine balance yeah. and, and difficult job. It can be good. Um, so... I know that um, Sadia Nafis had posted a comment and she is actually logged in from, I think, USA. So it's probably a really godforsaken art there. Um, so I, I would really like, Sadia, if you could like say a few words. Sadia is a researcher at University of Bangor. She has worked a lot in uh, mental health research. And she's somebody who is really passionate about the cause of capacity building for health research in Pakistan. In fact, she was the first person that I ever discussed this idea with, and we even tried to, you know, uh, write a grant together on that. Um, so, Sadia, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mariam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be among all of you, and uh, I really, really um, appreciate uh, mentioning that uh, my enthusiasm, as I said even in the questions, that I'm very passionate about capacity building and training. And um, just for introduction, I'm a dentist from Pakistan. That's my clinical background. I did master's from University of London and I did my PhD in healthcare sciences. 
I've been in oncology for 10 years. That was my PhD. And I moved on to mental health from past four years. And in mental health, I was more with the self-harm and suicide, medication management, and mainly uh, my current project is about medical education. Uh, and psychiatry students, we are sending them to prison and for their placements. And recently I published that last uh, in June. So that's where I am. And uh, with uh, I agree with whatever here we are saying. And research culture is not like you can't develop in like overnight. And we are having some some challenges even in my university and health board. This is why we came up like we need to introduce this earlier during medical school as well as uh, the training, the foundation year trainings and stuff. And we have started like some of the sessions to introduce research methods uh, to the students as well as foundation year doctors. And this is where I will stop. I agree with whatever have been said so far. And uh, hopefully like I'm more than happy to be in touch and hopefully Mariam will be collaborating in future. Thank you so much, Mariam. Yes. yes. Just, uh, just a response from comment from earlier. Uh, I have been shopping. It happens all over the world. In UK, these are called ethical committees. So when I was submitting one of my first projects, I was told, don't submit it this month, submit it next month, because that's a more favorable ethical committee. So it's a universal process. So, so don't worry about them. Uh, <laughs> Second, second. Uh, that, that is true. But I was surprised. But I was so well. Your your research has got a controversial yeah, component. Like briefly say, um, I, I mean the reason I can't stand still is because I'm so excited that we are getting so many ideas for our project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how to go about assessing our needs and our capacity because there are so many rich ideas that have come up in discussion today. So please continue. Uh, this so, is very small, but. Also, like when I hear you, it's like being me when I was a researcher that we have the same challenges. Mm -hmm. So in Argentina and Uruguay, in all the Latin American countries, and I think mm -hmm. all of this. Ah, yes. So I'll be telling everyone to use the microphone now. <laughs> so. Uh, hearing you, uh, as I was saying, uh, hearing you is like hearing my team, my research team in Argentina, and I think for Frank is the same. So we all have the same challenges. We all think the solutions are the same. So uh, we, we need to work to 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 make the change, and 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 talking and discussing is the best uh, the best first step. Uh, but th that's my only thought. You can continue. Sorry. No, no. And then the second thing is about IRB role. I think we all totally support IRB role. I think it's very important. It's vitally important for research. It's just changing the perception of how IRB works. So because perception becomes, you've, you've uh, elaborated on that anyway, because I thought the police were trying to just stop everybody from doing research. And I, I promise you that's what, what is perception among junior adoptions. And, yeah. So, <laughs> but but I, I was thinking about how to actually overcome this perception. So there need to be, and again, that's just my own opinion or idea, that you need to have a separate arm of IRB where bad researches or something happens, goes to that arm, which supports people. And, and rather than rejecting them, you, you form a support group saying, yes, you have received your proposal, but we would like somebody to work with you and help you develop this further. And this will give a soft picture of IRB role. Just my own opinion. I don't know how it will. We have been trying to do that. We have been trying to do that. So before our research comes to us, we, we do our preliminary review. And we do give our suggestion. And ha I have my team. We have Ikra, we have Sadia, and we have Fatima. And they are telling people the tips to you know how to make a yes and make a better application that had that has better prospects of being uh, getting approved. And this is what ha we have been doing, and um, we have been appreciated for that as well. Uh, and and yes, but that's like um, um, you know it's an additional work. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Can I? Yeah. Sorry. Sadia, you want to say something? Thank you. Uh, can I just chip in to that one? Because 
this is one of the things I'm first and foremost, I would say you can um, imagine my enthusiasm because I'm in San Francisco at the minute and it's half past two over here. So if I can't get the things right, please uh, forgive me. So, so I would say that uh, um, we have got, a, I'm part of the ethics committee at uh, Bangor University and I'm in the governance. And we got like research synthesis kind of thing, like where they, uh, any doctor, nurses, um, students, they bring their ideas to us and we discuss to, to make like into a research question. And then what would be the appropriate methodology to answer that question? So that's something like research and development, maybe uh, a, a, a kind of initiative. So Farah, maybe you already have that in place. Yeah, I think Farah was just saying that that's yeah. a function, that's that's an additional um, favor that they do for proposals coming into them. But I think that Dr. Irfan is absolutely right. One, one of the other things that perhaps could happen is that I know that at SKM, it's a very, um, everybody's extremely busy and to take time out to do this is already a pressure added again on a very busy IRB anyway. But just now said they were talking about research um, groups and research support groups, maybe ask people to join those voluntarily and be mentors or be like, you know, big brothers to people who are, you know, okay, well, you know what, we've gotten it, but why don't you just go and show it to them and see if there's something else that you can actually do. So maybe not take all the burden yourself, but have another group of people who are voluntarily providing time because Dr. Farhana also mentioned that, you know, she also struggles with the requests for research and, and doing. So maybe if their, their department can also voluntarily offer one person to sit there and guide somebody on how to do data collection. So it's about how you structure your research support in an institution. And that is the institution's senior management, which needs to recognize that this is a lot for you guys to do as an IRD. And they need to recognize that they need that you need more systems in place yeah. in order to provide that. And I think that's something that comes across from the global network as well. Yeah. But you also, I think, um, have that research operations uh, module that you actually have, and maybe that would be something to explore. Yeah. A so, so, so one because, of the yes, things yeah. that you know we were discussing we, because we were discussing these challenges during the conference as well, um, and we realized that it's like a, you know a catch twenty two of sort where you know you don't have people who are trained, and then when you train people, you know. So, uh, so, uh, so we wanted to focus on things that are tangible and doable first. Uh, so, you know, providing ways uh, or access to training um, to those who are interested, uh, making sure that they uh, they know of the availability of those training programs. Like Frank also mentioned that many people use a global health network for GCP training, but they don't know that there are other resources on that very uh, rich uh, learning hub. Uh, so just, you know, really like putting the message out and then slowly and gradually these things will come and research clubs is certainly something that we are you know thinking of not just for us but for other institutions where the capacity lacks you know even more even more yeah uh, yeah so um uh, i i just wanted to uh, say dr nida has been very quiet um i, I saw her uh, hand raised once and then it was quickly taken down I, Dr. Nida is also, you know, some of you may be aware, she's, she's a, a surgeon. So, uh, Dr. Nida, if you would like to, you know, yeah. add some things there. Um, yeah. No, no, I, I have been listening to it and I'm actually thoroughly enjoying the discussion because it's bringing out most of the issues that we are facing on ground. And as a clinician, I 101% agree with Dr. Irfan what he was saying, because as a clinician, uh, talking about research and conducting research and involving residents in it, it's an uphill task because as a supervisor, I have to involve my resident to various researches as a part of the essential part of their training. And it, it is like asking them to do extra work because there's no protected hour for research. So I, I was just listening to them. I'm actually, I'm agreeing to most of the things which are being said. That's why I was quite, because it was a good, rich discussion that was happening there. So yeah, I, I think uh, need, uh, for me, what is most important for Pakistan is the need assessment for research. What well, the kind of research that we are doing are, are not fulfilling the needs at all. And uh, it's, whether it's the field of surgery or any other field, uh, we are doing these searches which are just random and do not address the need of Pakistan as such. Yeah. True. 
Um, in the end, um, I think that our research team has been absolutely quiet throughout this discussion. And they are the, you know, the frontline warriors of how research happens here. Um, so maybe like a comment from all of them. Um, yeah. Uh, I was trying to make a comment, but uh, was eager to hear, hear from you people, like you are the experts. So um, continuing with the comment that Dr. Natasha and Dr. Farah has made, that it delays the processes, like when we do preliminary review of the submissions, which are sometimes of very poor quality. And um, I would like to add here that uh, we, did, uh, we did a review of informed consent forms. Uh, submitted to IRB for the last two years. And uh, uh, we uh, we checked the consent forms for completeness and essential elements as required by ICA GCP guidelines. So our uh, results showed that uh, out of 125 consent forms reviewed during two years, the average number of revisions was 2.4. So just imagine that uh, 125 consent forms reaching the IAB secretariat for review and approval. And the efforts that we uh, had to make required a lot of provisions. And maybe sometimes it happens that version number, uh, it is the version number fifth that is going to IRB full board for review. So just imagine the efforts that have been made uh, during just a preliminary review, and then comes the full board review. So yes, uh, we definitely need to uh, train the researchers uh, because uh, it is uh, the basic level that needs to be uh, developed more and more so that processes get smoothly and more and more like projects can be reviewed during less time. Uh, and uh, uh, in addition to that, what another challenge that I uh, like face is um, uh, like I feel uh, other than uh, educating the uh, researchers at institution level, we need to uh, get uh, local collaborations more and more. Like uh, we do collaborate internationally uh, most of the times, but the challenges that we face is amongst the collaborations which are at local level. So maybe uh, this thing should be addressed uh, at priority. Great points, Ekha. Um, uh, I think everyone here would agree with that. Do we have any other volunteers? Sadia, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, uh, I would. I would really no. I I would really like that Sadia should say something about the scientific Sadia review is so process. So insightful. So uh, we would yeah. like to. Uh, you know, a study around this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so we'll also ask Fatma. Ji, Satya. I I would like to comment on on supportive su support services you provide to researchers, and uh, one of those uh, include the templates, the prescribed templates we develop, and they are freely available on an uh, intranet or internet. And I think, to best of my knowledge, it it increases the uh, the researchers ability to to uh, to develop the the protocol the consent form and um, and uh, and it helps the researchers very well in um, and in uh, i have been working here for four and more than four uh, years and i really um, i have seen a you know an increase in um, in compliance or in quality of uh, research proposals, because at scientific review, we um, we ensure the the, um, uh, the uh, requirements. yes requirements with our templates, especially the protocol uh, with scientific validity. So yes, it improves. It has been uh, improved and it has been improving. Yes, study design and overall quality of the research proposal. Yes. That, that, that's, 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 and still, it is not common to hear that uh, Shoghat Hanum has research guidelines. There are always walking in people <laughs> yeah, who are just people. unaware. Oh, yeah. Uh, are they available? Where they are available? And you are telling them each time. So over to Fatma. Okay. Okay. That that's great. So, um, so just to like like mm -hmm. add a little bit. Um, uh, so Fatma works on, as I said, our post approval oversight 
um, and uh, and whatever little training that we do provide right now, including the Global Health Network GCP, uh, that we got like more than uh, 160 people across the hospital to complete. So, which is, I think the largest pool, I, I know GCP training is just a basic, but you know, this is one of the largest pools in Pakistan for an institution to have. Uh, so, so we decided to evaluate ourselves. So Fatma did an evaluation of the training that we do provide. It's an informal training other than this GCP, there's, you know, informal face-to-face -face and virtual sessions that we do. Uh, and, and we did see that over the three years that we had started doing this, there were improvement in some areas. Uh, but but that we continue to face challenges in other areas, and you know we will now be developing this further. I I really think it will be so incredibly valuable if you were to do an audit, asking the researchers what their experience was through this whole whole process. Yeah, that's what we have so, done. So Atta, so this yeah. is the this is the post. Yeah, so so she. No, this was the GCP guidelines, right? No, no, no. no this was no. The, so what we did was yeah. we used the Kirkpatrick model to evaluate uh, the support that we were providing to in uh, to the researchers and the impact it had. And one of the aspects of that model was that the people that you are training, you ask them how valuable or how useful that training was. So, so this was your cohort of those who you were providing training to. Yeah. What about those people who go through the IRB review process? I, I was thinking about them. So yeah. your yeah, it's the same cohort. So so yeah. they're the same cohort who yeah. submit su submit yeah. um, so, reviews. So our 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 guidance comes in after uh, for their conduct right now because it's it the process the 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 model has just been developed. We are uh, we have started with just you know providing support on the operational aspect of conducting Got it. research. Got it. Uh, the plan is to expand these right. two greater. Okay. That's models. exactly what I yeah. want to know. Yeah. So uh, regarding the uh, like uh, knowledge um, of uh, like in uh, assessing the knowledge of uh, researchers over here at Chakrapanam regarding IRB, we have been planning a study like a CAP study. Uh, to get to assess the knowledge, attitude, and practices of clinical researchers towards research. So I think this is the time. Next. So I think this is the time when we are oh, moving okay, so towards the uh, Asia okay. Knowledge Hub Pakistan chapter. So it would add um, our, our our study and the results will be going to be uh, adding um, um, to this chapter as well. Like we'll be assessing the needs of our researchers. And um, uh, it will help develop the uh, developing the training audios for specifically their needs as well. So um, uh, I will definitely looking forward um, to this thing as well. So um, concluding remarks by Mercedes and Frank, they have been you know very patient hearing us talk about our problems. <laughs> I'll give it to them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, Mercedes. <laughs> so I don't know, to me, all this resonates quite well with what we have sort of set out to do. And I think when we were chatting with Mariam, we kept saying, we need this, we need that. So we have been putting the list down. And I think the next part will be to, with, with all what we have said, to prioritize what are we going to do for the next maybe three months, six months, and beyond. We even went beyond to speaking about uh, getting maybe even establishing a master's in uh, clinical research, you know, hosted at uh, Shepard Cannon. Um, so, and people, whenever you train people, they will go. There's someone who trained me, I'm here today. Yeah. Um, I don't know how they feel, but if we train more, then we'll still have something in the pot. So, yeah, and, and I really like the idea of um, IRBs should not only be, uh, you know, checking and saying this is good or not good, but also, also they should train people of how to make their proposals good enough, as long as there are proposals that are beyond resuscitation, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> But for those that can be resuscitated, I'm so glad that you already have started with operational. If you have uh, common mistakes, maybe proposals make, we can also 
uh, just as what we were saying yesterday, that we can select a few training uh, modules that correlate with what you guys are doing here and add them to the Pakistan hub. We can even have like IRB treatment or, or whatever you call it, uh, training modules. So for example, if people have problems of consent and then we have how to, we have a lot of toolkits for how to make consent, training. If it's, um, it's about the protection to vulnerable population, if it's sample size calculations, all that. So that instead of for them to wait to sit in the room to do it, you can say, okay, for your problem, we can even create um, a selectable menu. Uh, what was your proposal about? What was the challenge that you faced? And then several causes can populate. So this person can go and do them and hopefully enrich. Oh, see. So I think that we have, we have we, these solutions, we can just harmonize them and, and put them out. But uh, so far, I expect we are going to be very, very busy and make Salvia very, very busy to make sure we, but then at least this group should continue talking. So here, um, you should continue even maybe in a month time, sit down together. The global network came here. Uh, what next process, next, uh, what, pro what is the progress? You can ask us if we also slowing down to give you response so that we can keep this going. And um, those of us who joined us today or who indicated their wish to join us today, because there are many who are, who are still messaging that, you know, they couldn't join today, but they would love to be a part of this. It's important that as a, as a group, this group stays connected and this groups like uh, keeps a conversation ongoing at regular intervals, um, you know, deciding for ourselves what we wish to do. Uh, and then of course, getting your help to go about doing that. Uh, and then of course, you know, um, making Selvia more busy. Uh, <laughs> Looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that, um, so um, we can perhaps end here. Uh, Nida, would you like to add something? Nida didn't get a chance. Um, so Nida is also one of our research officers and she's at the operational end of things. So okay. let's end with Nida's comment. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Mariam, for giving me this opportunity. So... Actually, I'm not uh, like a co-person for operating uh, for the IRB and scientific review, but I uh, had a, a play a role in a multinational global uh, uh, trial on COVID vaccine. So what I experienced uh, in the research field is basically the lack of education of the people regarding the research. Uh, for especially the placebo controlled trials where uh, when there is a pandemic so uh, everyone was like uh, keen to uh, uh, receive the vaccine so uh, in pakistan um, we have a, 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 like uh, we need to educate the people regarding the research then secondly um, Still, like in Pakistan, we have some misconception about the vaccine, polio vaccination. So majority of the people uh, don't get that because they have some misconception like infertility and so on. Secondly, uh, the grants that you all uh, expertise have already mentioned this. So uh, these uh, are the basic and the major challenges that we face. So uh, I, I think that we need to work on this, like the trainings, workshops, and uh, the education. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think this was a great summary. And Nida came up with a point that we had not discussed, which was the importance of community engagement in you know furthering research in a community, and of course, education and funding. Thank you for this wonderful conclusion. Just, just for one thing, I'm trying to think the next step that Frank has uh, mentioned. So we can work uh, together to make sure we advance uh, with these actions and so that we make progress. And then we could have like every six months a session like this one. Uh, we have you, where we have the head of education, everyone giving their insights. We can show what we've done so far and then everyone giving their insights. And also if they know what we've done, for example, the head of education can uh, make sure everyone gets the ethics uh, and ethics training in, the, in, in early stages to then avoid uh, having to train them on how to uh, get approved by IRB. So the, ideally, then we want 
we won't need it because of course not for everyone but So policy makers, institutional policy makers, so this is senior management, I think one of the important things that they need to be communicated about is the importance of actually inculcating any kind of research training for all people who come into the institution. So, I, I mean, I'm using Aga Khan as an example because that's the one that I know of, but um, so all basic scientists, even if they're research associates or assistants, have to go through the basic um, uh, research methodology and research ethics training. There's an online module that they have to complete within the first three months of joining. Similarly, all medical students have a proper module on research methodologies. So do PhD students. So every strata of, um, of the institution has this mandatory training. So I think introducing the word mandatory research training is something that perhaps, again, you could start with SKM as the case study and the role model. Okay, how can you bring it into each strata? Nursing has its own way of doing it. The the surgeons have their own. So if you if you provide it as a as a way to give each department the the sort of you know um, project that okay now for your department develop a module that you're going to do and link it up with HR that now within the first three months everyone joining has to go through this kind of so maybe something like that can be so uh, could be we, this yeah so we have actually started working along these very same lines uh, a mandatory training i mean of course it's work in progress it's not fully um, in place yet uh, but it has started so right now um, so we started with gcp because this was something we could link with something tangible it was part of a JCI requirement as well. So, you know, we asked that everyone needs to do this first. So, you know, uh, and then, you know, the, the basic uh, responsible conduct of research, a short video followed by a brief quiz is something that we require all principal investigators to do before they initiate this. We are gradually expanding this to, you know, nearly all teams, all members of the team. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's uh, and for GCP we have already done so. Uh, so so it, again and then again we are creating a research misconduct module. Uh, so slowly and gradually because we also again don't want to overwhelm people who are already complaining right. of lack of time. Yeah. Uh, so so it's a, it's a fine balance and I think at some point a discussion regarding protected time for research will that is exactly place. what I was going to say with so with, with 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 the management they're going to have to back you up with this by giving people protected time. Um, any other thoughts that anyone would like, Salvia, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, um, Salvia, for joining us, Sadia, Dr. Hana. Um, I think uh, Ifat and Mohammed Hassan, I see them online as well. I hope you guys were able to catch some of our conversations. Uh, please um, do stay connected. I hope you guys have filled in the registration form so we have a way of reaching out to everyone. I think this was um, I think this was great today. Yeah. One last short thing. I would like to highlight the work of these two women either. Yeah. And closing us so beautifully. With me. Yeah. So we both. No, but. All the team, uh, yeah. uh, having you to push everything yeah. and to make things happen, yeah. to have always the initiative. Of course, I know all the team has a lot of initiative, but with them to it, the team at least, it's everything. Uh, it's extremely important and inspiring. And Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Uh, I think it has been beyond inspiring getting to know Salvia and Frank and Mercedes in the last couple of months. Um, um, you know, with Bonnie and Trudy, we had, you know, had, you know, a year or so, uh, in fact, almost two years that we did work. But I think with all three of you, and I really, really would like Salvia to join us in Pakistan next time um, because they did have a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, they'll tell you the stories. <laughs> 
so uh, so yes uh, i think it's also very important that when you set out to do such things um, you connect as a team and i think we have all of us um, uh, the kind of interest that we have like um, you know seen i mean uh, even people who couldn't join us today uh, they send me these really long messages uh, explaining in full details why they could not join us today uh, <laughs> uh, so so i think that you know people really realize how important this is uh, and if somebody can wake up at 2 am am half asleep to join us uh, from you know so so yes so there is certainly a lot of uh, you know passion and commitment towards this uh, so we can i can end here yeah. i appreciate the